before we continue with um, with Pastor Smith's evidence, um, yesterday I asked I asked a question of um, this witness relating to some documents, a code of conduct from uh, staff handbooks and some other related documents that um, Pastor Smith had, had um, noted in his statement, and I said that the Royal Commission had. Uh, not obtained copies of any of those documents, and that's certainly the case. And what I did not intend to imply, that there was some deficiency on the part of Northside Christian Centre in that production. So, Pastor Smith, I still, rem uh, still <laughs> remind you that you are still bound by the oath that you took yesterday. Pastor Smith, I'll just take you back to a couple of documents that we um, we covered yesterday. Tender Bundle 2, if they would come up. This is the letter of the 29th of April 1983 that um, you wrote to Ken Sanderlands <laughs> after his period of probation. You recall this letter from yesterday? Yes. And um, now, prior to Mr Sanderlands joining... Um, the college at Northside Christian College. Um, did you know him? No. Had he been a member of the church prior to that time? Not of my church, no. Um, what about his wife, Olwen? Had she... Did you know her prior to this time? I first met her in 1968 when I was the assistant pastor of the church that she attended. And um, you... <laughs> You, what was your relationship with her between 1968 and 1983? She was a member of the congregation. Right. And uh, was she a, a friend? No. When, when you assumed responsibility as the senior pastor in 1981, she was there as a member, was she? Not at my church, no. Right. Um, did she become a member of Northside Christian Centre? No. And did you attend services there from 1983 onwards? No. Um, but I presume that uh, Mr Sanderlands did at that stage. No. Did he not attend? Uh, sorry, I withdraw that. Um, I understand from uh, Pastor Spinella that he frequently attended uh, prayer meetings that I think were held at the college. There was a staff prayer meeting that was held, yes. Yes. And um, did he also engage with the church in the sense of attending on Sundays or no. other occasions? No. Right. And were you friends with Mr Sandlands? Only as a teacher. Did you see him outside of the school setting? No. Did you see his wife outside of the school no. setting? Yesterday I also took you to uh, letter tender bundle five. It was a, a handwritten letter from the principal, Mr Ellery, to you, dated the 30th of December 1986. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and you, refer, <clears throat> you recall there there were, con, um, there were concerns about uh, Mr Sanderland's conduct, weren't there? As expressed in the memo, yes. And... That, um, <clears throat> that um, Mr Ellery had reached the position that there was no case proven. Correct. Um, and then he said he was prepared to... ..defend him to the hilt. Do you see that term there? Yes. To, so you understand that to mean that that meant defending... Mr. Sandlands to the hilt against allegations of imprudent conduct. No, I did not read it that way. I read it as a principal caring for his staff. Right. Um, and what did you understand that to mean in terms of investigating allegations of um, child sexual abuse or conduct that may have appeared to be such abuse? That didn't enter my mind at that stage. Excuse me. 
it didn't enter the, it didn't enter your mind that what was being investigated by Mr Ellery may have been child sexual abuse correct what was the the innuendo to your understanding that Mr Ellery is is talking about in that first paragraph My knowledge of that was that he was uh, in close proximity to children uh, at that point of time. Um, further, uh, he wanted to establish a, or reinforce from his point of view that the relationship between the teacher and the student should be well maintained. And essentially that's how it was expressed to me. What was the innuendo in your mind caused by that close proximity to children? It certainly was not sexual at that stage. Are you saying there is nothing in this memorandum that caused you to think there was any implication or indication or danger that Mr Sanderlands was involved in some form of sexual abuse? Yes, because I was accepting the principal's um, response to me was that there was nothing proven, but he was not going to put himself into a, uh, allow Mr. Sandler to put himself into a position where th there was any in innuendo that could be interpreted. But the only innuendo that there could be was that there was some form of sexual relationship between. Sorry, I withdraw that. There was, the only innuendo that there could have been was that Mr Sanderlands was engaged in some sort of conduct that may have been sexual abuse of children. I have no way to acknowledge that from this. So there was nothing in this memo at all that indicated to you that there was the possibility of sexual abuse by Mr Sanderlands of children? Correct. It was entirely about... The proximity or cuddling of children, is that right? That's as much as I knew, yes. Is that your honest answer? Sorry? Is that your honest answer? Yes. Let's go to the next uh, memo, the one on the 20th of March 1987. You recall I took you to this yesterday. Yes. And you'll see that the allegation was that he had a child on his knee. First of all, you, do you see that? Yes. And that he was touching her on the lower stomach and on her legs. Do you see that? Yes. And there was reference to him being warned about his actions prior to then. Do you see that? About yes. four paragraphs down. And that another severe warning was was um, thought to be necessary. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. And then he goes on to say, if any such future incidents were able to be proved undeniably, then I would have no hesitation at all to recommend instant suspension and dismissal. Do you Correct. see that? Are you saying that... Uh, sorry, I withdraw that. So certainly it was the case, wasn't it, that Mr Rooks was saying to you that there was something very serious about Mr Sanderland's conduct that was of concern to him, wasn't it? Yes. And it was serious because there was touching of, child, of a child? As reported in his memo, yes. Yes. That the placement of the child on the knee and yes. that the touching on the lower stomach and on her legs. Yes. That was a serious conduct, wasn't it? That was an allegation. Yes. Serious conduct, yes. Yes. And that was serious, wasn't it, because it indicated that there may have been some form of sexual abuse of a child. By in your new yes. And Mr Rooks was saying to you 
that if such was proved, well, he says undeniably, then he would say that the appropriate recommendation was instant suspension and dismissal. You see that? That's what he's written, yes. And you said yesterday that you accepted that recommendation. On that principle, yes, I accepted that principle. Indeed. And that's because the conduct that was the subject of this memo was possibly child sexual abuse. No, at that stage it was still innuendo and allegation. Yes, to me, if, which I was asked. But if the innuendo or the allegation was established, then the only appropriate action was suspension and dismissal. That was the what Mr. Rooks had written, yes. And, it, and, and you he, agreed, he would recommend and, that, I'm sorry. And you agreed that, with that, didn't you? I would agree that in principle to that, yes. <laughs> Now, you see from that memorandum that, first of all, you see the second, sorry, the first paragraph that um, the three grade five, six girls had spoken to um, um, a Miss Abdul Messia. Do you see that at the top? Yes. And then as a result of that, the principal and Mrs Brown had interviewed each of the, the grade five, six girls? Correct. And that Mrs Brown had then gone further to talk to the child involved, who said she had been on Mr Sandland's knee, yes, but denied being touched apart from being cuddled. Do you see that? Yes. So it's clear from this that a form of investigation in the nature of interviews of children had taken place by the time that this memo came to you. Correct. And Mr Rooks was worried about the school's reputation um, if those incidents were allowed to continue. Do you see that? Not yet. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's the fifth paragraph. Yes, damage the school's reputation, yes. And you were also concerned about the same issue, were you not? <clears throat> yes. And the reason for being concerned about the school's reputation because, was because the conduct of Mr Sandland, or the allegations of that conduct, were or implied that he was involved in some form of sexual abuse of children. At that stage, no. You don't think that those matters, if proven, implied some form of sexual abuse? Indeed, if they were proven to be sexual allegations, yes. But, but the, if they were established, so I'll just um, <clears throat> go to it. He says in that same paragraph, if any future such incidents, do you see that? Yes. And that's a reference to the incidents that are set out in paragraph one. Uh, Correct. Yes. And. <clears throat> He's referring to the child seated on the knee and the touching of the lower stomach area and legs. Do you see that? I do. And he's recommending suspension or dismissal if those matters are <coughs> established. Approved, undeniably. If they approved, then those actions warrant suspension and dismissal. Do you see that? And that would have been the recommendation, recommendation I would have expected from the principal. And... You'd agree, wouldn't you, that um, the reason, the reason, sorry, I'll withdraw that, the, <coughs> sorry, I've just lost my place.
He's not saying at that point that if child sexual abuse is established, then he would recommend suspension and dismissal, is he? He is saying that you just the incidents as reported above were continued, as I read that. Sorry, I missed the end of that, I think. The... I read the, the memo that even though they were allegations, if they were to be proven undeniably, then he would have, he would have no hesitation to recommend instant suspension and dismissal. He's not saying... I agreed with him. He's not saying... He was not saying in this memo that if child sexual abuse was proved undeniably, that he would have to be suspended. Was he? He was not saying that at all. He was referring to the events above, I understood. Thank you. All right. Um, now, I understand, if we go to Tender Bundle 7, that the next step you took and maybe you can assist us by reading um, what I presume is your handwriting. For which I apologise. Um, <coughs> this is a, a memorandum which appears to be to KWI, that's Mr Ingram, is that right? Yes, he was the Deputy Chair of the Council and, and an Assistant Pastor of the Church. And JR was a uh, reference to Mr Rooks, the, oh sorry, NR. In, uh, I'm sorry. In the light of the information shared with me recently, I am requesting you to fully investigate the situation and report to me prior to the interview with Ken Sandlins. I am very concerned with the report and wish you to treat it with great seriousness and urgency. All right. Now, um, Pastor Ingram, or Assistant Pastor Ingram, then in, in uh, <coughs> 1987, he was not um, a teacher at the school, was he? Correct. Was he on the school council at that stage? I believe he was the deputy principal. But he was not a teacher at the school? Correct. What uh, experience did he have um, in education? In the area of uh, academics, none. His background was in the area of radiation oncology in his secular life. Given that you had um, an experienced principal who had investigated the situation, why did you provide the matter to Pastor Ingram to investigate? As the chairman, eventually I would be called upon at some time to make a decision, and as there were only allegations at this point of time, I asked him to go back and recheck the incident and give me a further report. So you knew by that stage that um, the girls had been interviewed um, twice, if we count uh, the conversation between Ms abdul Masia and the one between Mrs Brown and Mr Rooks with the children. Indeed. And you wanted a, a further investigation done of that? Yes, because at this stage there were still allegations. We go to uh, Tender Bundle 8. You then received a report from um, Pastor Ingram. Now you're aware, aren't you, that um, you're aware, aren't you, that um, Mr. Rooks had not signed off on this particular um, memorandum? I can see that. Yes, it only comes from Mr. It Ingram even though you had written to both Mr Rooks and Pastor Ingram asking for an investigation to be conducted. My expectation is this would have been done in consultation. Now, if we go to that, incident, that uh, report, we see at point one, it says that the incident spoken of was largely embellished by the girls concerned and certain connotations put upon it that were constructed more on their imaginations than fact. Do you see that? Yes. And so you took it from right at the start of this memorandum that 
there was a question about the the veracity of the material provided by the three grade five six girls. I took it exactly as it says. I didn't add anything further to that paragraph as it stood until I continued to read. Now you knew from paragraph three that um, Mr. Sanderlands. Um, did have a child on his knee, or at least beside him as he was sitting on the chair. Do you see that? Yes. And while there was some discrepancy, there was also some corroboration of that, namely the girl herself says she was sitting on his knee. Do you see that? Yes. So you, were, you knew as a result of this <laughs> investigation that, that at least that part of the uh, matter <laughs> had been proven? Yes. You see that um, at five, Mr Ingram says that the scenario that actually took place would be quite normal in a teaching situation, although there is some question whether a child be allowed to sit on a teacher's knee. Do you see that? Yes. Now, this is Mr Ingram, and I think you said, did not have educational qualifications at that stage. Yes. And was not an experienced teacher, was he? Correct. So do I take it that you were relying on a non-teacher to make a comment such as it would be quite normal in a teaching, a teaching situation? No, I received the report as him quoting Mr Rooks and Mr Parker. Now I see that Mr Sandlands specifically in Catagrop denied any untoward action. Do you see that? Yes. Now, it appears if we go over the page to there's point seven and then the, the paragraph after that, you'll see that uh, Mr Ingram asked Mr Sanderlands what instructions he'd received from the previous principal. Do you see that? Yes. And Mr Ingram, Pastor Ingram, concludes that the instructions given were rather nebulous and that he should take precautions in handling children, particularly female students as an insurance policy against <coughs> any further accusations or innuendos. Do you see that? Yes. And he says that no specific instructions, such as not to have children on his knee, were issued according to Mr Sandlands. Do you see that? Yes. And then Mr Ingram goes on to say, this probably agrees with the memo of the 31st of December, that's the uh, handwritten letter that you'd received. <coughs> Do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, the date is slightly out. It says a memo over the 31st of December, whereas the letter is dated the 30th of December. Do you, do you accept that that's the same document he's referring to there? Yes. And that in that letter, he, that is Mr Ellery, had told Mr Sanderlands to avoid studiously any situation where anybody could possibly impute evil or put an unfavourable construction on it. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Now... In this report, it appears that Pastor Ingram has gone to Mr Sanderlands and asked him what the warning he'd been provided. Is that right? As I read that, yes. Yeah. <coughs> and that he hadn't gone back to Mr Ellery to establish what exactly he had said to Mr Sanderlands by way of a warning. I'd say that would be correct because Mr Ellery had left the school. Did it cause you concern that Mr Ingram was relying on a warning... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. Did it concern you that Pastor Ingram was relying on Mr Sanderlands, the man against whom allegations had been made, was providing the source of the warning given to him? I do not accept that. I think that uh, Mr Ingram would be looking at the file, the, the staff file, and reading the information contained in it was held by the principal. But he didn't speak with Mr Ellery, did he? Mr Ellery had gone. 
He's not at the school. Was there a telephone at the school? Indeed. Did you not expect him to ring Mr Ellery and ask him what was the warning that he had provided to Mr Sanderlands? No, I did not, because the information I had was that he had spoken to him not to have not be cuddling children and had children on his knees. That's as I understood it. That's what you understood the warning to be? Yes. What's nebulous about that? Nothing is nebulous about that. Well, let me go back to that first paragraph there on the screen. We say the instructions given were rather nebulous, according to Mr Ingram. Well, they weren't nebulous, were they? Well, that is Mr Ingram's response, not mine. And I, uh, I can't interpret his response. Yes, but this was a report to you Indeed. in which he had said the instructions were rather nebulous and you have just told us that the instructions were quite clear about that fact. The instructions were clear to me that he was not to persist in cuddling children and putting children on his knee. That is as much as I can remember. But that's what he had been found to be doing in April of 1987, wasn't it? It appears so, yes. Contrary to a warning that Mr Ellery had given him at the end of December 1986. Yes. And you didn't take any action at that stage to suspend or dismiss Mr Sanderlands, did you? No, I would be dependent upon the principal's recommendations to me because he was the expert in education, not me. Well, you were relying here on, the, on somebody who was not the principal. You were relying instead on the associate pastor of the church to provide you with the appropriate way forward. With respect, the memo also states that he'd be in consultation with the principal and the teacher. But the recommendation is not from him. It is from... Associate Pastor Ingram. Agreed. And he says no disciplinary action. Do you see that? Yes. And you accepted his recommendation, didn't you? Yes. So notwithstanding the fact that he had acted contrary to a warning provided to him by Mr Ellery, you accepted a recommendation that he not be the subject of any disciplinary action? From that memo, yes, but also it would have been in consultation <coughs> with the principal. Further, you see at point four on that page, if we just scroll down, that the three grade five, six girls concerned were to be given a firm lecture as to the dangers and implications of their stories. Do you see that? Yes, I have. Now, you knew from Mr Rook's memo that he had a different view about the veracity of the children's um, account. I'll just go back briefly to tab six of the tender bundle in the second paragraph there. You see that he and Mrs Brown interviewed each of the three grade five, six girls. <clears throat> yes. Some inconsistencies in their accounts, but perceived an element of sincerity and concern. Do you see that? Yes. And yet, when we go over to Pastor Ingram's report, he is recommending, in fact, he's already delivered a firm lecture to the five, six girls about the dangers and implications of their stories. Do you see that? Yes. So it appears to be the case that Pastor Ingram has taken over the role of the principal and admonished those girls from reporting the matter in the first place. Do you agree with that? To the point that he was doing this in the presence of Mr Rooks, Mrs Brown, and in some cases... But Mr. how do you know that? It says so in the memo. Where does it say that? Five. After five. Upon All talking with Mr... in the presence of myself, Mr Rooks, Mrs Brown, and in some instances Mr Parker, and each of the children were interviewed individually. Yes, but it doesn't say the admonishment at four on the second page was given 
in the presence of those other people. That was my interpretation of it. And he says, I have already taken the liberty of doing this. Do you see that? Yes, I do. He doesn't say we have, does he? Again, I link that paragraph four with paragraph five. Now, the interview panel is set out of paragraph five. All the interviews were done in the presence of myself, Mr Rooks, Mrs Brown, and in some instances, Mr Parker. Do you see that? Yes. And each of the children were interviewed individually. Yes. So I presume that means that each child came in one at a time and was went before this panel of teachers and church members. Is that right? I have no idea how it was conducted. Well, it said so there. I can presume that. And... By my count, if Mr Parker was in the room, you had three men and one woman with one child of about ages 11 or 12 being interviewed. Yes. Did it cause you any concern that the child may have been intimidated by the number of adults in the room who were interviewing them? It did not, because... My trust was in the educational leader that he would be handling this according to his own capacity and knowledge. But you hadn't given it to the... Sorry, I withdraw that. It wasn't the education leader. It wasn't the principal who was providing this report. It was Pastor Ingram. Pastor Ingram was providing a report, but my memorandum went to both the principal and Mr Ingram. And my expectation was... But this report... Sir, this sorry, report... I wondered if the witness could just finish. Sorry. Probably better for the transcript in any event. Sorry, sir, please continue. Did you finish your answer? I think the transcript may have picked it up. You'd like me to finish, sir? If you okay. if you had more to say, yes. Nothing from what I've just said, no. Thank you. But this report was from Pastor Ingram, wasn't it? Indeed. Well, I object to you. Know, the, the, recommend, the document says our recommendation. It doesn't say my recommendation. It says... Our recommendation, to be fair to the witness, our is clearly a, a plural rather than a singular. Yes, well, fair enough. But in any event, this memorandum was from Pastor Ingram, wasn't it? As the author. All right. You didn't... Do I take it then that you didn't see anything wrong in individual children from grades five and six, for example being interviewed individually by a panel of four adults? At that stage, no. Had you had any experience of investigating serious allegations where children were witnesses? No. Were you concerned that it does not appear that the parents were involved in any of these meetings with the children? I understood that the MIMO said that the facts would, were given to the parents so that they knew what actually transpired. I'm asking you about those particular interviews with the children. There's no indication there that the parents were present the, during I what had occurred. I would assume that to be correct, yes. Um, and that the meeting, that the sorry, the putting of the facts to the parents was something recommended by Pastor Ingram, but which had not occurred at the time that you received this memorandum. I can only accept it as it's read that the principal and Mr Ingram decided that they should call the parents in to let them know what had happened. Did you think it was justified? to give those grade five, six girls a firm lecture, given that they had been, in Mr Rook's words, sincere and concerned about the younger child involved in sitting on Mr Sanderland's knee? I do not know what was actually said uh, to the students in this words firm lecture so I, I I have no comment really on that I was not there I was expecting that the the principal 
would be there to supervise this and whatever the uh, the warning was, um, pardon me, not the warning, the, um, I've lost the words, I'm sorry. The firm lecture was, uh, they, uh, Mr Ingram's words, not mine. Is it right to interpret this memorandum in any other way than effectively what occurred was that the school rose to defend Mr Sanderlands against allegations made by some grade five, six girls? Well, that was the recommendation of the meeting between the principal, Mr Ingram, and Mrs Brown. And is there any other way to read this than defensive of Mr. Sanderlands and his interests? They evidently felt, as I read this, that there was nothing proven, nothing conclusively proven. And you accepted that? Yes. And you accepted the admonishment of the girls concerned? As an historical fact, yes. And you did that because you were concerned about the reputation of the church and the school? No, I did that. As a, it was a normal way that I uh, worked in my leadership role. Now, as a result of this, some guidelines were put in place for Mr Sanderlands. Is that right? I understand, sir. I'll show you Tender Bundle 9. Now, these were the guidelines that Pastor Ingram had recommended you you impose upon Mr Sanderlands and his work. Is that right? My presumption was that they came from the principal. I don't know that, Why they, was, were, what was the know that they were attached to any other memo. All right. Well, let's go back. Sorry, I'll go back to Tender Bundle 8, point 2 at the bottom of the page. Our recommendation is at point two, Mr. Sandlands be given specific guidelines as laid down on the attached guidelines for KS teaching. That was the recommendation, yes. Yes, and attached to this memorandum were the guidelines that are at, at tender bundle nine, which will come up now. I did not know if those were attached to that actual memo. You don't know or you don't recall? I don't, well, I don't recall. But you, you... I know that they came into existence, but I don't know when. All right. And you know that guidelines were imposed upon Mr Sanderlands? Yes. And those guidelines were imposed by you? By the principal. Well, the recommendation... Endorsed by me, but so I, I agreed with them, yes. You agreed with them, but their recommendation was made, that is... It wasn't a reporting from the principal to you that guidelines had been imposed, was it? No, it was giving me what they were. Yes. What the guidelines were. And it was recommending to you that the guidelines be imposed. Indeed. And you accepted that recommendation. Yes. And you imposed the guidelines upon him. No, the principal did that. It was his responsibility. Not <coughs> The recommendation is that the guidelines be imposed upon him and this memorandum was given to you for decision, wasn't it? Indeed, but it doesn't say how it was to be done. My understanding was that this was given back to the principal who himself uh, produced this. this is, these are not my rules. And I was informed that these were the rules and they had been in, enforced. Or not enforced, well, but they had been given to him. Well, they may have been given to him. Just going to those guidelines there, um, you agree that these were the guidelines that were imposed upon, 1980, uh, upon Mrs so, yes. Sanderlands in 1987? And you were aware of the guidelines? Yes. And you were aware of the terms of the guidelines? Yes. So if we just go through them, 
the reason for the guidelines, first of all, was to stop Mr Sandilands engaging in um, the conduct that's set out in the guidelines. Correct. And that was because there were concerns that Mr Sandilands had engaged in such conduct. As I don't know whether he engaged in all of that, but at least these were the guidelines that the principal put on him as a response to his own understanding of the situation. For example, using the sick room as a teaching area, I would have no idea what that was about. All right, so it's re sorry. So if we go through them, the first one is not to touch any child apart from a pat mm -hmm. on the back or a, ha or a handshake. Indeed. And you knew by this stage that at a minimum there was cuddling of children. Yes. And there was the placing of children on his knee in the classroom. Yes, but I might, I might say that I'd see that around the playground as teachers were walking around the playground that many of the younger children were taking the hands of many of the teachers that seemed to be a normal activity for children in the playground. Yes, I'm not talking about taking of a hand. I'm talking about cuddling and I'm talking about placing a child on his knee. From that point of view, yes, that's what the guidelines were. And that's because that was the sort of behaviour that there was concern about prior to and in April of 1987. Which would cause the principal, I presume, to write these guidelines, yes. And which you were concerned about as well, as a result of the memoranda given to you by Mr Ellery and by Mr Rook. Yes. Um, if we go on, he was not to pick up any child. You see that? Yes. And he was not to place, instruct or allow any child to sit on his knee. Yes. It's fairly unambiguous, isn't it? Correct. Um, he was not to remain in any room with the child on his or her own. Do you yes, see that? I do. And the room... Uh, sorry, the word any is underlined. Do you see that? Yes. Um, so there was concern, was there, in April of 1987 that uh, Mr Sanderlands had been in a room with a child on his own. That could be an interpretation. It's a reasonable interpretation, isn't it? Yes, but again, not by me as not being the author of this. One presumes that is the case. But you knew as a result of reading this that there was concern from the, the drafter of these guidelines that Mr Sanderlands had been or there were concerns that he had been in a room with a child by himself? Yes, the principal had, had those concerns and he responded to protect the children, I presume, from, as, from this, and uh, these were his standards. And then point five, re-discipline, refer to the principal or deputy principal for usual discipline procedure. Um, <coughs> Agreed that the usual discipline procedure was that um, if discipline was to be imposed upon a child, then it was to be a male teacher with a male student and a female teacher with a female student. I became aware of that, but I did not really know the details of the discipline procedure. Were you aware that that was a rule at the college um, from 1987? I was aware of it to the extent that my own children were in the school and um, as a parent I would have understood that, yes. And then if any female child seeks attention about a sore knee, pain in the stomach, a problem with clothing, etc., refer them to a female teacher. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So do I take it that there was concern by the drafter of these guidelines and the principal that uh, Mr Sanderlands had been attending to children in those ways, even when they were female children? I, I could not answer that question. Did these, evidently the principal knew something or was looking at the a global response to specific allegations and he created this list. Well, they weren't global allegations, were they? Oh, pardon me, yes. Well, for example, do not pick up a child. If a child falls over, I presume he would break that if he had to pick them up. But generally, I think that the rules are there putting the boundaries around his responses yes, but as a teacher. 
what I'm saying to you is that there was really some quite specific concerns about Mr Sandland's behaviour in April of 1987. Those details are specific, yes. And that they are reflected in the guidelines that were provided to him. I accept that. And then the last one is that he not use a sick room as a teaching area. Do you see that? I do. And is it reasonable to assume that's because Mr Sandland's had said to perhaps Mr Rooks, perhaps Pastor Ingram, perhaps to somebody else, that he had used a sick room as a teaching area? I, I have no idea. Have you, did you hear any allegations about him being in a sick room no. with, child, with a no. child? Pastor Smith, when you say you have no idea, do you mean as at today you have you have no idea? At that what? time, I, as I answered the questions, Your Honour, um, I did not know anything about the sick room as a teaching area. I was not involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the college. I couldn't even tell you now where the sick room was. I was aware of, of these documents, and they seemed fair to me, that they established the boundaries of what the principal expected of one of his teachers. Just, um, just remind us, Pastor Smith, what, um, who, who was the principal answerable to at this time? The principal was answerable to the college council. Yeah. And who was the chair of the college I council? I was the chair of the college council, yes. And in my absence, the deputy chair would take that role. And um, matters such as uh, whether or not one of the teachers at the school was sexually abusing children would be a matter of considerable concern Indeed. to the council. Indeed. <clears throat> so when you saw the recommendation for these guidelines, <coughs> excuse me, did you ask questions about what the basis of them was? I accepted the fact that the principal, with his expertise, had set some parameters around the teacher as he was the person operating the school from day to day, and they seemed appeared to be acceptable to me. My response would have been, are you comfortable with these? If he had said yes, then I'm comfortable with those. And what did you understand was the reason for setting those boundaries? As a result of the previous memo, memorandum to me, a recommendation that this be done. These, these guidelines have arisen as a result of um, concerns, haven't they, that have, been, uh, that have been uncovered by those investigating the reports? Indeed, but my response to your, your question was that the previous memorandum was that they do set up some guidelines for him, and I understand these were the guidelines that were set up. Yes, but the question is... Why were the guidelines, why were they set up? What were the concerns that you understood them to be directed towards? The principal was putting, a, putting boundaries around the teacher because of his concerns expressed to me in the memoranda that were sent to me. Now, I'm not asking you about the principal, I'm asking you about you, what your understanding is. My understanding was I read these, and as they were at this stage all allegations, nothing proven in, in, in any form of concrete, that this was a, uh, an adequate safeguard to protect anything further happening. What was the safeguard against? The uh, kind of allegations that had been unproven allegations that, that had come across my desk. And what was the nature of those allegations? as stated in the, the cuddling, the, the whispering into the ear and those kinds of things, which the principal felt was um, unworthy of a teacher. And, it. What, and what did you think? I had to agree with him because he was the educationalist. I, and I, I still Did you have no separate, did you have no separate concerns, no separate um, reflection yourself about what you were hearing? Your Honour, I'm, my style of leadership is I'm not a micromanager. I trust the staff that, that are there. I empower the staff to do their job. And I had 
no, um, as the two pieces of information that were given to me were, were that they were unfounded, I accepted the report from the principal, the deputy chair of the council, that they indeed were unproven allegations. But as a response to that, the principal required some boundaries to be set around the teacher so that there was no way that any thing, any other allegations would reoccur. That's as I understood the document to be. Thanks, Mr. Beckett. Um, I wonder if uh, Tender Bundle 40 could come up. Uh, this is a police statement made on the 17th of March 2000 by Mr. Neil Rooks, the principal at Northside Christian College. And if yes. you go to paragraph 9 of that statement, it's on the third page, ringtail 82. You see there, it says that um, the detective showed Mr Rooks a document titled Guidelines for King Sandlands. Yes. Upon reading this document, I, I can say that I contributed to the substance of the guidelines. These guidelines were explained to Ken in person by Pastor Smith and myself. <coughs> Ken agreed to these guidelines and told us he would abide by them. Do you see that? I do. Do you accept that you were at that meeting? Yes, if the, if the, if the uh, that's the statement of the principal, yes. All right. Now, you understand that um, in October of 1987, further allegations arose against Mr Sandlands. You're aware of that? If you can show me the document, I'm... Well, just from your memory, do you recall there being further allegations in 1987? I'll have to accept that from your records, not mine, I'm sorry. So you don't recall it? I, at this stage, I cannot with definiteness put that date on, but I accept that. I'll show you a, a, another police statement, this time Thank you. from Keith Ingram, dated the 6th of March 2000. Just scroll down so we have uh, that paragraph in full, please. Thank you. And um, it's a document that you've read recently for today? Only a couple of days ago, it's the first time I've seen it. Until I arrived here, I hadn't seen it before. We'll see there in the middle, in the middle, that. Um, <coughs> It's a redacted, a child said one of Mr Sandland's students, AGB, was standing in front of him between his knees. Yes. I, I read that, yes. Um, and further that um, AGB was sitting on his knee. <laughs> Indeed. And then the further allegations that had arisen in, in March 1987 are dealt with. Do you see that? I, I, I read it, yes. And then if we go down to the, down the page to that last paragraph. There was an allegation that from some parents and some general rumours that Ken had allowed some students to sit on his knee and that on 20th of October 1987 had been seen to kiss one of his students. Do you see that? I see that. And that on the 22nd of October, he and Neil Rook spoke to Ken Sanderlands about the allegations. Yes. And... He was, in, he was told that he'd breached the guidelines. You see that? By Pastor Ingram, yes. And, this was, and that the breach was causing concern amongst parents and fellow teaching staff. Do you see that? I do that, but I had no knowledge of that until I've just read it now. And 
he had been allowing children to sit on his knee and he had also kissed Emma for the same reason. Do you see that? I see that, yes. And that he would probably do this about once a week. Right. So there was frequent kissing according to Pastor Ingram. Indeed. And you'd agree that they were breaches, both of those acts, as the sitting on knee and the kissing were breaches of the guidelines that have been imposed on him. As I read the information now, yes, but again, I had no knowledge of that information until now. take you a further document, Tender Bundle 19. Uh, you're aware of the chronological summary of allegations that Mr Rooks prepared in December of 1993? I have only now become aware of it at this meeting. I hadn't seen that before. You were aware of this chronology, weren't you, in 1993 when the, um, the allegation, when there were a number of additional allegations that arose? This is the first time I have seen at this Commission. It's the first time I actually seen Mr. Rooks's statement. I had never seen that before. It was his own personal thing, I would imagine. So, if we just scroll down the page, you'll see that there's an entry for the 27th of October, 1987. You'll see there. NR and KWI, as Neil Rooks and Keith Ingram, Keith Ingram reported to, to DVS of further allegations against Keith Sand Ken Sandlands. Do you see that? Yes. He had been seen to have children on his knee and had kissed one of the girls in his class. Do you see that? I read that, yes. Yes. Do you accept that uh, that report was provided to you in October 1987? Not the details of that report. No, as I said, that's the first time I had actually seen this. I had not seen that before. Do you not recall? I recall the fact that the, the allegations were, were brought against him, but not, not those details of those children. Right, so let's just establish what you do remember. I you do recall remember there was a meeting, so, I'm sorry. You recall there were allegations that had come forward in October of 1987? Yes. And... The allegations were against Mr Sanderlands? Yes. One of the allegations was that he had children on his knee again? Yes. And another allegation was that he kissed one of the girls in his class? No. You don't recall that? No. You recall Mr Sanderlands admitting to breaching the conditions of the guidelines? I would have imagined that, yes, I think I would have. And... Do you recall him also admitting kissing um, Emma Hayes as she then was? No. no. If we go over the page, it then says that <clears throat> Ken Sanderlands was given a severe reprimand for breaching the guidelines and the condition that he adhered to the guidelines was added to the request that he continue his teaching ministry at Northside. Do you see that? Uh, yes. And you accept that you gave that uh, reprimand to him? With the principal, yes, I would have done that. All right. So, sir, so it appears to be the case that we know in 1986 that uh, Mr Sanderlands had been given a warning um, by Mr Ellery. Yes. By March of 1987, he had breached that warning. Yes. But there'd been an investigation, hadn't there? Yes. The investigation had established that there, there, that he had children on his knee. On his knee, yes. That he had been cuddling them. Yes. And that, uh, as a result, um, relatively restrictive guidelines had been imposed upon him. Correct. And the guidelines included uh, prohibiting him from having children on his knee. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and prohibited him from having other than incidental contact with children. Yes. 
and you'd agree that you'd received information in October 1987 that he'd admitted to breaching those guidelines yes. by having children on his knee. Yes. And perhaps also you accept now, wouldn't you, that it was known then, in 1987, that he'd also kissed one child in particular? I had not heard that before. Do you no. accept that now, that that was... that, um, first of all, that happened in 1987? I have no knowledge of him kissing children. All right. I have him... Do you, do you accept that you did know, in 1987, on the basis of this record kept by Mr Rooks, As I say, this is the first time I have seen this. So I'm, I'm reading a, a memo. Are you saying principal. that this part of the memo about kissing is wrong, or are you saying that um, um, you just do not recall it today? I'm saying that this is Mr Rooks's memorandum, uh, memorandum to himself, not mine. And I'm reading what is written there. I cannot prove one way or the other whether he did or he didn't. I wasn't there. Now, and so I've not seen this before. Given that there were ripples, apparently, in 1986 about Mr Sanderland's conduct, you, you agree with that? That there were ripples, yes, it yeah. was raised. That uh, Mr Ellery had investigated certain conduct which he was concerned about? Yes. That there were action contrary to a warning that had been given to him in March of 1987. you agree with that, wouldn't you? To the warning, yes. And that there'd been action in March of 1987 contrary to that warning? Yes. And here again in October, we have further action contrary to guidelines that have been set in April of 1987. Yes. Why did you not sack Mr Sandlands for a breach of those guidelines in October of 1987? Because the recommendation for the continuity of his teaching there would have been recommended by the principal at that stage, and the information I had placed before me was certainly not the information I have now, but the information I had then was that there were unproven allegations and there was a breaching of his um, uh, the guidelines but there was no recommendation that that was serious enough for him to be fired he <clears throat> breached a warning in March of 1987 and he breached guidelines in October of 1987 you accept that don't you yes and whether or not there were proven allegations of child sexual abuse there were certainly breaches of conduct warnings and guidelines, weren't there? Indeed. And you'd had now the Ripples 1986 allegation, that's <coughs> two, the March 1987 conduct, and now the admitted October 1987 conduct. Didn't it occur to you that this man was completely unable to abide by warnings or guidelines imposed upon him by the school or the church? To answer that question, the way I operated was that the principal was empowered to run his school and if he had made a recommendation at that time to conclude him, I would have done so. So you're, you're the chair of the school college, aren't you? Indeed. And you're the chair of the church board, yes. aren't you, at that stage? All of these matters are coming back to you in the sense that Mr Ingram is reporting to you and Mr Rooks is reporting to you. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. Why could you not, of your own volition, see that this man was not to be trusted around children to abide by the guidelines that had been set? The fact was that I, in hindsight, I can see that, but at that point of time, 
according to the information that was given to me, that the principal evidently felt that it was still insufficient uh, reason because he had broken these guidelines to sack him. And I had no recommendation to do so. And I normally only worked on those recommendations at that stage given by the principal. Did you understand by October of 1987 that the conduct he was engaging in exposed him, first of all, to allegations that he may have been sexually abusing children? I must confess, the sexual side of it had not come into my attention, come to my attention um, or thoughts uh, at that stage. When it did come to my attention, I requested the principal contact the relevant authorities and find out what he should do under the circumstances. When was that? I cannot tell you the exact date, but certainly at one of the times, um, if not both, I requested the principal to contact the um, authorities. And I understand that in the first case, and if not the second, that the principal contacted an authority whether it was the Education Department or the police, I cannot be sure. This, this was not in 1987, though, was it? No. In Did you take a note of that? That he'd contacted them. Well, did you take a note of asking him to contact them? Or did you get a memorandum from him about those matters? I was informed that he had contacted the relevant authorities and was told to, if there was no proven allegations, he was to conduct this in-house as a principal. And, uh, yes, I noticed you said that in your statement. Um, it doesn't seem to be any reference at all to referring matters to the police in any of the memoranda between 1986 and 1993. Do you accept that? That was the information I was given from the principal, yes. Well, you've recalled that now, have you, some, some many years later? I can recall that then. Yes, that was the case. Now, were you aware, sorry, um, as a result of that, after giving the severe reprimand to Mr Sanderlands in 1987, were you concerned at all about the risk of Mr Sanderlands' behaviour towards children at that stage? I was not, because the guidelines were set and the principal was closely supervising him. So that was the nature of the protections that were provided to children at that stage. Is that right? And what other protections that the principal had there in his day-to-day -day operations. And what, what were they? I have no idea. All I knew about were the guidelines. Well, did you ask him? No. And he'd breached those guidelines, hadn't he? Yes. So the guidelines were of little effect when it came to Mr Sandland's behaviour towards children, weren't they? It would appear in hindsight, yes. Was it not appropriate at that stage to seriously consider whether this man had a future role at Northside Christian College? In hindsight, yes. At that time, no. Now, I understand that <laughs> there was a meeting on the 26th of May, 1987, uh, that I've skipped over, of the, um, the Northside Christian College Executive Council. Tender Bundle 10 will come up. Now, I think we've established that by April of 1987, the guidelines have been imposed on Mr uh, Sandlands. Yes. Um, and you'll see that there's no mention at all of Mr Sandlands in this particular report. To I, the... I only have the first page, so I accept that what you're saying is correct. You know the document I'm referring to, though? No, no 687. <laughs> yes. The one I, that's on the I screen. can only see the first three paragraphs, so I, I, yes. I, I, if you're saying he's not mentioned, he's not mentioned. All right. 
and we'll see if we scroll down a bit, there's mention of Anne Brown and there's mention of guidelines on discipline and so forth. Yes. Was there any reason, was there any reason that you didn't refer the, the matters concerning Mr Sandlands to um, the College Council for discussion? The, at, at that stage, no, it would have been a, a choice of the principal because basically the principal set the agenda with me. Well, you were the chair. Indeed. So a draft agenda would be brought to you and um, if you wanted anything introduced, you could um, include it, I couldn't could have you? done that, yes. Yes. And you didn't do that, did you? In that case, in that time, no. Was there any particular reason why you didn't inform the school council of the investigation into Mr Sandlands and the, um, the decision to impose guidelines upon him? I cannot tell you the exact time. I think it eventually did go to the council, but at that time, no. Now, I understand you may not have been in, in, in the hearing room when, um, Ms, when Ms Furlong gave evidence, is that correct? I have not been in any of the hearings. All right. Now, Ms Furlong said that um, she received um, <clears throat> allegations of touching by Mr Sandlands, which she passed on to Mr Rooks, and I'll go through them. First of all, that um, Mr Sandlands had touched AGV in 1987 and informed Mr Rooks. Were you ever informed about that? No. <clears throat> no. Um, in 1988, Emma Hayes, as she then was, Emma Fretton now, told Ms Furlong that Mr Sanderlands had touched her and, she, and this was passed on to Mr Rooks. Were you aware of that at the time? No. And in 1989, um, AGW, you may wish to have a look at the pseudonym list there. Do you see who AGW is? I do, yes. Um, and were you aware that AGW had spoken to Ms Furlong and told no. her... Uh, just let me ask the question. I'm sorry. Um, AGW had spoken to Ms Furlong and told her that Mr Sanderlands had touched her and then reported that to Mr Rooks? No, I was not aware of that. Were you, did you have any discussions in that period, 1987 to 1989, with Mr Rooks, where he um, told you about touching of children by Mr Sanderlands? No. Did you later become aware of those allegations? Only after I had read reports, virtually after I had left and, and what I've read here. All right, so in, we come to 1989, and if we go back to Tender Bundle 19, there's an entry of the 20, for the 22nd of August 1991. Um, so these are allegations by AGT's mother. about four girls frontally embracing Mr Sanderlands, wiggling their bodies, and also um, one or some of them embracing him from behind and touching his genital area. Do you see that? I see it. And uh, you received that allegation in about August of 1991? I did not receive those details, no. This is the first time I've seen these. Um, you've read it for today, is that right? I, I read it as part of the tender bundle, yes. take you to the relevant part of it, but um, Mr Rooks says in his police statement that there was a letter um, from you 
to AGT's mother saying that the situation is being monitored. Do you accept that uh, you wrote such a letter? I wrote a letter to Pastor Sharman um, informing him of the information essentially which I've shared here of the, of the details of, of what had been happening and um, that, that was the, the essence of it and Pastor Sharman was uh, received my report. What he did with it, I have no idea. Uh, but do you also accept that you, um, that you wrote to AGT's mother, a student's mother? I don't believe I did, no. Um, so you dispute that uh, that is Mr Rook's evidence in his police statement? That is Mr Rook's uh, um, remembrance of it. It's certainly not mine. And that's... I, would, I would have written to the pastor who contacted me, not the parent. You knew that uh, Ms Lovell was then investigating the matter by interviewing the children concerned? I became aware that, that the principal had set up um, a committee, if that's the correct word to use, or a group of people to carry on investigations. I was, I was not at those meetings. I was unaware of what happened at them. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. Um... That Ms Lovell hadn't investigated the matter and certainly determined that there had been cuddling by Mr, uh, uh, my, by Mr Sanderlands of children. Do you recall receiving or being told about that report from Ms Lovell? The only report I received would have come from the principal, not from Ms Lovell. Um, did you know that he was basing his, um, uh, his knowledge on uh, a report that Ms Lovell had provided to him? I was aware that he had set up a, a group within the school to investigate this, yes. But I did not know the details of it, well, let's, as uh, let's, are expressed here. So if we scroll down this page and we'll come across to the next page, it's ringtail 33. You see that a meeting of DVS, NR, KWI and SM discussed the whole matter and agreed that although he had probably no, not broken the legality of the guidelines, he had in fact broken the spirit of them. Do you see that? Yes, I can read that. Um, and do you recall that there was a meeting between those um, four people, including I have you? to accept that that's Mr Rooks's uh, recollection of it. All right. So you knew by that stage that, um, that it had been confirmed that Mr, uh, Mr Sanderland had been cuddling children again? It would appear so. And you knew that there was an allegation of genital touching by children? No, I did not know that. Did you know there was an allegation of that? No. Um, did you read Ms Lovell's report of what had occurred? No. We, <clears throat> sorry. So when in this note it says, discuss the whole matter, are you saying that allegations were kept from you by some of those present? My only comment is that this is Mr Rooks's uh, remembrance of the meeting, not, not mine. In any event, you knew that Mr Sanderlands had engaged in cuddling of children. Yes. And that that was a breach of the guidelines? Yes. And it was a breach, in fact, of the guidelines, not just the spirit of the guidelines. <laughs> uh, if I comment on Mr Rooks's words, probably not broken the legality of the guidelines, but the spirit of the guidelines, I. That is his response. What was your response? Well, my response to this is now as to what he has written, I accept. If I'm commenting on his, his response. Yeah, what was, first of all, what do you remember about the conclusion you reached when you were told he had been found to be cuddling children again? I accepted the recommendation of the principal. Well, before we get to the recommendation of the principal... That. No, sir, can you please concentrate on what on my question which is what conclusion did you reach thank you as a result of that particular matter namely the cuddling and the breach of the guidelines my conclusion would be that he had broken indeed the spirit of the guidelines to quote these words here you accept that the guidelines say that he was not to have physical contact with children correct he was not to have children on his knee yes 
what part of that? Sorry, I withdraw that. The um, had, knowing that he had been cuddling children, how are you able to say that that was not a breach of the legality of the guidelines? I'm first of all commenting on Mr. Rooks's words. Um, I am being advised by the educators as in this in this whole matter. But, Pastor Smith, it was just wrong, wasn't it? What was wrong, sir? He'd been cuddling children, and that was a direct breach of the guidelines that had been imposed in April of 1987. My response is technically it would be indeed wrong. However, um, it was a, a common thing I saw the, the few times I was around there where uh, teachers would put an arm around a child and hug them and cuddle them and, and, and so forth. And so at that stage, I accepted that as a, a normal part of life. But this man had guidelines that had been imposed upon him specifically to stop him from doing that, hadn't he? Correct. It wasn't a part of normal life for Mr Sanderlands because he had guidelines telling him not to do exactly that, hadn't he? He had the guidelines indeed, but I was not policing it. Well, you were sitting at this meeting at which um, Mr Sanderlands was being considered, weren't you? Being considered for what? Well, considered for admonishment, for suspension, for dismissal. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. And so as a result of, as part of that activity, you had to impose that, you had to um, consider the breach of the guidelines that had been put before you. Yes. And it's simply not the case that the guidelines had not been breached. That was the conclusion with consultation with the principal as to what I should do as far as keeping you on the staff. And you agree now that that conclusion was entirely wrong? In hindsight, absolutely. And now you have a position, we have a position now that in 1991, this is the third occasion on which warnings or guidelines have been breached by Mr Sanderlands? It would appear to be, yes. This man had no capacity, that is, Mr Sanderlands had no capacity to abide by the warnings or guidelines that were imposed upon him, had he? With respect to favouritism and soliciting affection, as I read here. Well, do you agree with what I've just put to you? No capacity to abide by warnings or guidelines that were imposed upon him. In hindsight, it would appear to be so, yes. And you knew that at the time, didn't you? I knew that to the degree I was informed concerning that, yes. And what you then did is, notwithstanding those breach, you admonished and rebuked him. That's correct, isn't it? With the principal, I, yes, I spoke to him. But allowed him to continue teaching? Yes. And what steps did you take to ensure that the children concerned that he had been cuddling and touching and so forth were protected? That would have, again, gone back to the, the, the school, the, the structure of the school. Well, and so the structure of the school, first of all, there was the principal who was sitting over the teacher's concern. That's right, isn't it? Indeed. Um, but there was nobody at that stage that was in his class, was there? Could you say that again? There was nobody monitoring his behaviour in his class, was there? Mr Sandals? Yes. I believe that, that a parent or a teacher's aide was put in his room, yes. Well, that comes later, doesn't I'm it? I'm sorry. At that stage, evidently not. So all that there was were guidelines given to Mr Sanderlands not to engage in such behaviour. Yes. Which he had breached on now two occasions. Yes. Do you not accept that the imposition of guidelines and the oversight providing, provided by the principal had completely broken down by 1991. It 
would appear to be yes. And you, you realised that in 1991? Yes. But you determined to keep Mr Sanderlands on at the score? That would be with the recommendation of the principal, yes. Yes. Your Honour, is that a suitable time? Yes. We'll take the mid-morning break, Pastor Smith.
spread, please. I'll stop, thank you. Um, you'll see that there was the meeting, well, it's just off the page, but there was the original meeting <laughs> where it was determined that he had broken the spirit of the, of the guidelines, but not the legality. Um, and then um, you had an interview with him in which he was admonished and rebuked for breaking the guidelines. Do you see that? Yes. <coughs> um, and then there's a further meeting. It says, at a further meeting on the same day, Mr Ingram, Mr Murray, Mr Rooks joined with uh, Pastor Smith and Keith Sandlands. It was emphasised that there was an agreement that there was no doubt that KS's intentions and motives were pure and in no way sexually oriented. Do you see that? OK. Um, so you'd agree, wouldn't you, that um, in the mind of the people who were at that meeting was that the conduct may have been construed as sexually oriented towards children? I read that to say that they were not. Yes. That they were not what? Quoting there that the intention and motives were pure and in no way sexually oriented. Yes. But in doing so, they had to determine, sorry, they raised in their minds, or that is the meeting discussed, that um, whether his conduct was in some way sexually oriented. For the principal to come to that conclusion, I agree. Well, it doesn't say the principal. What it does is it refers to the meeting. Uh, with respect, I believe this is Mr Rooks's response and reading to himself. Well, this is a summary of material of memoranda that he had available to him at that stage, so I don't think it necessarily follows that it is his, his opinion. So when the word it is used in that particular paragraph, there's no other indication than what it says there, namely that those at the meeting with Mr Sanderlands, including you, yes. emphasised that there, there was no doubt that his intentions yes. were, pure. were other than sexually oriented. Do you see that? I read that his intentions and motives were pure and in no way sexually oriented. All right. In order to come to that conclusion, it had to be discussed amongst those there whether the, his conduct was such sexually oriented. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? To come to one conclusion, I would accept that it would need to be discussed, yes. Yes, all right. And so it had occurred to those present that his conduct towards children, particularly the cuddling of girls, allowing them to hug him and so forth, may have been sexually motivated. The possibility exists that they could have been interpreted as that, is how I would interpret yes. that. Yes. And so there was discussion about that and a resolution reached that it w was not sexually oriented. Is that right? If that is the principal's rec recollection, yes. Well, it's... I'm not talking about... Sorry, I withdraw I'm that. Sorry. What's your recollection of the resolution that was reached about that issue at the meeting? <laughs> My recollection would agree with that, that the motives were pure and in no way sexually oriented, quoting those words. All right. But um, you'd agree that those issues about cuddling of children and so forth had arisen in 1987, hadn't yes. they? Yes. And is it reasonable to assume that when the cuddling of children and touching of children that was considered in April and October <coughs> of 1987 was considered that the possibility of that conduct being sexually motivated was in your mind? It was not in my mind, no. Again, because I was accepting the information given to me by the educators. Why was it important that a matter um, engage, involving the innocent cuddling of children make its way all the way to the chair of the church board to deal with? Because the principal evidently considered it was a matter of uh, 
concern on the way the teacher was working with his children. And he was concerned about the reputation of the school, wasn't he? The principal would be, yes. And he was concerned that the imputation was that Mr Sandland's conduct may have been sexually oriented towards children. That the allegation was there, yes. And that the reason that it was taken to you for your decision was because of the available imputation that Mr Sandland's conduct in 1987 was sexually oriented. For that reason, it was brought to me, yes. And when it arises again in 1991, the same issue is in play, if you like. I'm sorry, I withdraw that. When the issue arises again in 1991 of Mr Sanderland's cuddling and touching children, the issue behind all of that is whether his conduct is sexually motivated or not. If I can recall the date line, there's a period of three or four years where there were the principal had no uh, negative comments to make concerning his conduct in the classroom. But at the end of the time, it came up again for a number of reasons. One of them were these allegations. Now, you'd expect during that period of time, the 1987 to 1991 gap that you've just referred to, you'd expect that the, um, the chair of the church board and the school <coughs> council would have such an allegation and well, sorry, would have any allegation of child sexual abuse against a teacher brought to uh, his attention? That is your attention? If there was anything in those four years, yes, I would have expected that. Yes, and you expect the principal to bring that matter to you? Yes. Now, just to clarify, we have evidence from Ms Furlong that there were th three occasions, and I took you to those just before um, the adjournment that um, she had informed Mr Rooks on three occasions about um, allegations of touching of children by Mr Sanderland. You understand that, first of all? I understand that that was the, what was stated, yes. Yes. And um, you, it's your evidence, isn't it, that you were not told of any of those three occasions? That, that was the first I'd heard of it this morning. All right. Now let's um, <coughs> move on to 1992. If you just uh, scroll down the page, yes, thank you. You'll see there that um, DVS it reads, DVS reported on an interview with um, it's a child and AGP who had expressed concern over some mental scarring from an incident concerning the teaching of sex education when in Keith Ken Sanderland's class three years earlier. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And do you, rem do you recall that, um, that interview? I recall the mother expressing the concern over the uh, teaching of sex education, and I thoroughly agreed with her. And... Um, you're aware of who AGP is? I do. Now, we've been able to locate um, a police statement from AGP, which is a tender bundle 32, and I'll just take you to some parts of that. Um, is this a statement that you've read in preparation for today? It was made available, yes. Did you read it? Yes.
clothes on. The child was then asked what photos or something, and the child said, no, they look like they come out of a magazine. And then the child said, sorry, then the mother said, you mean he showed you pictures of men and women without clothes on from a magazine? And she said, yes. You see that? Yeah. All right, so if we go over to the next page. Um, it says that I, it's a reference to AGP, went and saw Pastor Dennis Smith after one after school one day, uh, and they met in your office. Do you recall that? Yeah, vaguely, yes, but I do remember that, yes. Yes, and is that the uh, is that the occurrence referred to as sex education, do you think, in the uh, in, in the earlier document, the one of the 2nd of April 1992, prepared by Mr Rooks? That would be my presumption. And... We continue on this, and you said Pastor Smith went on to tell us how children can make up things. Do you see that? Yes. And do you agree that that's what you said to her? Yes. And then she said, I then went on to tell him that if he didn't do something, we would go public with the story. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And then he said... Pastor Smith told us that we might have been throwing things out of proportion because we were such strong Christian parents and perhaps we were overreacting about what Katie had told us. Do you see that? Yes. And uh, do you agree that's what you said to um, AGP? I would accept that that is her perception of what I said, but I don't believe I would say those words. They don't sound like me. All right, but um, you, in any event, you agreed with the earlier part, that is, that you told them that children can make things up based on the information that had been given to me in earlier reports, yes. So do I take it from that that you were immediately sceptical of what um, um, the mother's child had said to her? On the contrary, I was a strong supporter of family. Children can make things up. How is that to be read other than scepticism on your behalf about the account that had been provided to you? I can't re recall the exact words I said, but commenting on her perceptions uh, <coughs> about that would be probably a reflection of what I had received in previous reports, uh, not knowing specifically that this child had been involved in earlier situations. Um, what are the earlier reports? would be a general comment. What are the earlier reports you're referring to? The memos I received from Ken, uh, uh, sorry, from Neil Rooks, the principal, who. Had you received any reports about the showing of pornography to uh, two children by Mr Sanderland? No. Had you received any reports about sex education prior to that stage? No. So the reports you're referring to are the, the, the cuddling of children, the having children on knees and so forth. Is that what you're referring to? The and so forth would can also contain the comments that the children were sometimes getting their stories mixed up words to that effect. And on that basis, you doubted whether the uh, story that had been given to you was true or not. Is that right? I would say I would, not, I would not doubt the fact of the sex education concept as well, because I do recall speaking again with the principal, <coughs> um, because we believe that the responsibility of sex education was not the teacher's responsibility, but the parent's responsibility. It was entirely inappropriate for any of the teachers at Northside Christian College, particularly in the <coughs> primary school, to be showing <coughs> pho photographs, pictures of naked <coughs> people to children, wasn't it? My understanding from the principal was that sex education was just not taught in any way by, by, the, well, by the teachers. I'm not asking you about sex education. I'm asking you about the showing of photographs and <coughs> pictures of naked people to children at the school. Uh, again. That was entirely inappropriate, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yet your reaction here is that you say... An investigation may not be the best way to proceed, and he talked about other ways of removing Mr Sanderlands from the school, and if I would be happy with that. Do you see that? Yes. Do I take it that you accepted at that stage 
sorry, I withdraw that. Do you agree with uh, what she said about what you what you said to her? I must to comment on her perceptions. There are words used that I would never use in my vocabulary about the original smother mother and smother father. Uh, I'm just asking you, sir, about investigation. Not, not may not be the best way to proceed. <coughs> you I agree? Is that or making that statement at all? And, and certainly, I, I would not have talked to a parent about other ways of removing Mr. Sandlin from the school. Was it the case that, in fact, you did say that, and that's because by 1992 you were perfectly well aware that Mr. Sandlands had been engaged in abusive, sexually abusive relationships with the children. No. And this was yet another example <laughs> of Mr Sanderland's engaging in conduct, <laughs> ambiguous or otherwise, that was child sexual abuse. Again, I have only just been made aware of this information. I recall the meeting uh, the family, um, but the other information I just have no recall on at all. If I did and said that, I would have my, my normal practice was to diarise these things, and I have no record of diarising that at all. Those details. Now, if we could go back to tender bundle nineteen. You'll see in the second paragraph listed next to the 2nd of April 1992 that um, Kerry Lovell investigated the matter and spoke to a number of parents who had <laughs> expressed concerns. Do you see that? Um, is it at the 0204 date? Yes, the second paragraph. I reported an interview. Uh, can we express? That would be my standard response. I would have gone straight back to the principal with that information, yes, in the first paragraph. And then the next paragraph, there was a, there was consideration of Kerry Lovell's report <coughs> by those, um, including discussion of 11 areas of Mr Sanderland's teaching style in June of 1992. Do you see that? Yes, but I had no knowledge of that. It actually happened. Well, you... <laughs> You said you'd pass it on to the principal. I passed, passed on the challenge to the principal, but how he worked on it uh, is, is here reported for me. I had no, no idea uh, of that report of actually how it happened. I was just informed that it had been, that it had been handled. And the, did you know, if we go over to the next page, that the significant issues raised at that meeting were that... Um, his answers to questions with respect to sex education in the past may have been too detailed. Do you see that? Yes, I can. Um, that his eyesight was deteriorating. Do you see yes. that? Yes, I see that. And that he had breached the guidelines by administering corporal discipline to female students. Do you see that? Yes. Right. We, did you become aware at about that time in June in 1992 that there were allegations of him administering corporal punishment in breach of the guidelines? I do not recall that, no. The eyesight, yes. And sex education, definitely. But I, I, the, the corporal discipline, I did not know that. So, being aware of that sex education, what, uh, having referred it to Mr Rooks, did you receive a report back from Mr Rooks about whether... Um, whether he also concluded that such sex education had been involved in? The report I would have got back from was that he would have spoken to Mr Sandland and told you not to do it. Now, did you not speak to him yourself? To Mr Sandland's? Yes. No. Why not? Because my style of management was always through the those in authority. But you knew that this was... The second concern, in, sorry, I withdraw that, that you'd had those earlier breaches of the warning and the um, guidelines in 1987, hadn't you? Concerning the cuddling and putting children on his knees, yes. 
and that you'd had further allegations in 1991 of him engaging in cuddling and so forth in breach of the guidelines? Yes, after four years of not hearing any reports. And in 1992, you'd received further concerns about him engaging in um, <coughs> some form of sex education with children? Through the parent, yes. Yes. And you'd had that interview in about April of 1992. I think you agree with me earlier. I, I'm unsure of the date, so I'll have to accept that. Why didn't, at that stage, you take action to remove Mr Sandlands from teaching at the school? Again, it was... The information was passed on to the principal. It's beyond my capacity. I strongly disapproved of it, and I told the principal that, and I told the parents that, because we always believed that there is, that responsibility was the responsibility of the parents, and I understood that the principal followed that through. I'm talking about your position as the head of the church board and the chair of the school council. What steps did you take following these new allegations of sex education or showing of pornography to a child to consider Mr Sandland's employment at the school? At that time, I had no knowledge of your words, pornography. Uh, the information I had was from the parent saying that her child was scarred because of this sex education. I took it straight back to the principal and said, what is this about? Please investigate this and don't let this happen again. So you agreed that um, Ms AGP, the mother, had told you that she had shown, that is, Mr Sanderlands had shown her child <laughs> Pictures of men and women without clothes on from a magazine. I was... No, I'm unaware of that. You're unaware of that now. Is that right? Well, I have not been aware of it. I've been aware of the sex education concept, that he was teaching sex education in those terms. But the actual details of how he was doing that, I had no idea. But you'd had a meeting with AGP, hadn't you? She'd come to see me, yes. And she'd told you about Mr Sandlands showing her daughter pictures of men and women without clothes on from a magazine. Again, that is her perception. I do not recall that. And you deny that she told you that at the meeting in your office with her and her husband? I have no recollection of those details. So what was the sex education that you're referring to earlier? The fact that the parent had used the word that... that Sex education has, has come back to me to say that why is sex education being taught in the school? And I said, well, I don't understand that. It's usually the responsibility of the parent to do that. That was my first reaction to that, or response to that. So you knew that there'd been some sort of discussion about sex with these children, contrary to school rules. From that parent? Yes. And given the concerns that there'd been previously about Mr Sanderland and his, and his ability to abide by guidelines, what did you do in April of 1992 and subsequently to follow up that issue and determine what appropriate course would be taken with Mr Sanderland? I referred the conversation to the principal, asking him to handle And that. what did he come back to you? What did you obtain from him? His response to me was that he had spoken to Mr Sandlins and reinforced the fact that edu sex education is not to be taught at the school. And uh, did you consider that was adequate at the time? I would take his recommendation, yes. Notwithstanding the fact that there had been these multiple breaches by this stage of the guidelines provided to Mr Sandlins? Not concerning sex education. This is the first time I've heard about it. Well, but it's not the first time you'd heard an association between Mr Sanderlands and sex, was it? This was the first indication I had concerning the relationship with Mr Sanderlands with hugging children and putting them on his knees and the possibility of sex, sex um, sexual overtones. You'd thought about it being sexually... Uh, there being sexual overtones in 1991 and excluded that, hadn't you? On the recommendation of the reports I had received. But you'd excluded yes. it, hadn't you? Yes. 
and then you're receiving further information about Mr Sandland's engaging in sex education with children in April of 1992, that's right? Yes. So why didn't you put two and two together and determine that Mr Sandlands, by this stage, was engaging in conduct towards children at the school which was sexually motivated? Because for four years I had, had no report of anything of a negative nature of Mr Sandlands. Well, you'd had, period, multiple, you'd had multiple reports of him hugging and touching children and having them on his knee, hadn't you? I had a couple of reports concerning, not multiple. Well, you had 1986, didn't you? Yes. You had April of 1987? Yes. You had October of 1987? Yes. You had um, the allegations in August of 1991? Are you saying that, that are, they are not multiple allegations against Mr Sandland? They are multiple allegations, yes, concerning him being in proximity to children, yes. And then in 1992, you have an allegation that he's engaged in some form of pre prohibited or um, sex education with children, contrary to school rules. That's right, isn't it? Yes. I've and you didn't, agree. at that stage conclude that Mr Sandlands was acting in a way which was sexually motivated towards children? Indeed, because I had no, none of the details that are in that report there are present. Now, if you go down, you'll see that um, Mr Rooks says he submitted a recommendation to you. Sorry, first of all, he submitted a report on the teaching effectiveness of Mr Sanderlands, yes. dated the 30th of November, and then a recommendation about a week later that the continuation of his teaching contract be reviewed in the light of lack of confidence expressed by a number of parents. Do you see that? Yes. Um, concern for the safety of children in his care. Do you see that? Yes. Um, his own safety. Um, the raising of historical allegations. Do you see that? Yes. And that's a reference to, you took it as a reference to these allegations that had arisen in 1991 and 1992? Yes. Breaches of established guidelines? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the difficulty in performing all of the duties expected of a teacher at the, at the college, is that right? Uh, yes. And you agree that all of those matters were put to you by Mr Rooks? Yes. And that the lack of confidence expressed by a number of parents was around him... Um, having children on his knee or cuddling yes, children? I would say yes. Uh, and a concern for the safety of children was um, a, a reflection of his, um, his, his contact, his physical contact with children, including hugging and putting them on knees? No, I believe that was to do with his eyesight, that he could not effectively see what was happening around him. And the breaches of established guidelines were the guidelines I took you to earlier, Indeed. the ones in 1987, Indeed. is that right? Yes. Now, you'd reported to the board, I'm sorry to go back to October of 1992, um, but just it was something I should have taken you to earlier. Tender Bundle 13 is a report to Mr Rooks concerning the upcoming Board of Directors meeting. Do you see that? Yes. And if we go over to the next page, you'll see at item 8 a reference to an interview you'd had with Mr and Mrs Sandlands concerning his future at the college. Yes and noting that his eyesight is continuing to deteriorate. Correct. And there's no mention in there. Um, so I'll scroll down so you can see the full entry. Concern about him injuring children under his supervision. Do you see yes. that? And you encouraged him to consider the possibility of a ministry to the blind. Do you see yes. that? Is that right? Yes. And then...
Um, you'd agree that there's no mention in that memorandum to Mr Rooks about concern about his conduct towards children? This memorandum is an extract of the minutes of the board which affect the college, which is our standard procedure after every meeting of the board. We extracted the, according to our constitutional documents, in corporation, we sent the principal areas which were discussed by the board, so he was fully aware. So many times the information All right. information came from the principal, but we always informed him of what was happening, yes. And do you agree that that was the extent of the discussion at the board meeting on the 6th of October 1992 that... Uh, that is what has been recorded, I say yes. Yes, all right. And then if we go over to Tender Bundle 14, there's a memo to Mr Sanderlands from you dated the 10th of November 1992. Do you see that? Yes. And at point three there, um, you refer to... You, are, you request, Mr Sandland, to provide you a letter of intent which outlines your desire to remain in the teaching system. Do you see that? Yes. And then at point six, um, there's reference to uh, advice from a fund advisor of the possible steps that he could consider if he ultimately chose a disability retirement. Do you see that? And... There's further details about that, but in any event, the memorandum is informing Mr Sanderlands that there is likely to be a benefit, a financial benefit available to him if he was to um, accept a disability retirement. Is that right? Which was information ever <laughs> provided. And that you provided to him. That's right. I isn't provided it? to Mr Sanderlands, yes. And then there's a, if we go to Tender Bundle 15, the next document, we have a confidential report to the Board of Directors from you and the relevant part concerning Mr Sanderlands is on the next page, ringtail 131. Scroll down, you'll see it at the bottom of the page there. And... It indicates there, so this is a report on the 5th of December, that a comprehensive medical report has been requested from Mr Sanderlands. You see that? Yes. And um, a letter of intent, including his, which outlines his desire to remain in the teaching system and also a performance review from Mr uh, Rooks. You see that? That would be a summary of my memorandum, yes. And then the next paragraph, it says, I have received this information and further instructed the principal to evaluate the medical report and make and table a recommendation for the 8th of December. Do you see that? Yes. All right. So by that stage, you'd received an indication from Mr Sanderlands of his intention? Yes. And... Um, you'd also received the report of the 5th of December... 1992 from Mr Rooks. Yes. And that was in, if you go to Tender Bundle 19, that was summarised under that particular date. Yes, the, that's a summary of those, those information. That's And so on the 8th of December 1992, if we go down to Tender Bundle 34, we see that he submitted a letter indicating... Oh, sorry. Submitted a letter indicating that he would be commencing a period of indefinite sick leave because of his degenerating eyesight. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Yes. 
So, do I take it that, um, as far as the board had been made aware, made aware by you, Mr. Sanderlands was retiring because of his failing eyesight. Is that right? Yes. Um, and there was no indication provided to the board that there were any concerns about his um, about his contact with children, particularly physical contact with children, first of all. Do you accept that? I think so, yes, I do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be reported. All right. Um, in, if I can just cover that period from 1987 through to his departure in 1992, um, we've had a, a close look at the minutes that are available from the church board and the school council during that period of time. And do you accept that you did not report during that time any of the allegations against Mr Sandlands concerning his physical contact with children? In that three or four year period, whatever it was, I had no reason to do that because the principal had made no comment to me as he was supervising him, not me. So notwithstanding that in um, April of 1987, Mr Rooks had said to you that um, he was concerned about the reputation of the church and the school, you did not take the matter to the board to inform them of what the allegations were. Mr. Rooks evidently expressed he was concerned, but he was prepared to run with, keep Mr. Sandler there because uh, that was his assessment of the situation. And I accepted his assessment. Yes, and but you didn't consider that it was something that you needed to take to the board to inform them of these allegations against him? At that stage, if, it, if I had, it would have been in my written reports, which I made to the board. Yes, well, we've... Well, and I have no record of doing that. Yes, and we've had a look at those reports and we can see no, no such report being made to the board. That's correct. And in October of 1987, when he breached the guidelines um, set earlier in that year, you also didn't take that to the board to report to them, did you? Because, yes, uh, that was true. And in 1991, when further allegations arose of, and admissions by him that he'd breached the guidelines, you didn't take that to the board either, did you? Correct. And in 1992, when you were informed about sex education being engaged in by Mr um, Sanderlands, you didn't take that to the church board, did you? Correct. So during that period, from the start of 1987 right through to December of 1992, were you trying to hide the allegations against Mr Sanderlands from the church board? No. Why did you not report those... Sorry, I withdraw that. You accepted the allegations, certainly by 1991, there were concerns... That, the, that his conduct was sexually motivated? For that four-year period, I had no negative report from the principal concerning Mr Sandlin's, and I had nothing to report. Well, no negative report. You had, a, you'd had reported to you that he breached a warning in April of 1987, breached the guidelines in October of 1987, breached the guidelines again in 1991 and been found to be engaging in some form of sex education in 1992, did you not think that those matters were worthy of report to the church board? At that time, no. You did not think that there was an important to raise such allegations with the church board so that you could see, seek their counsel and support with the approach you'd taken? If it got to the point where it was a proven allegation, it would have been automatic. But because they were allegations, you didn't take them to the church board? Because the educators told me that it was a matter that they were handling, I accepted that that's what they were doing. The board only received information concerning uh, that which has been expressed in the minutes 
extract. Did it not occur to you that if it was in fact the case that Mr Sandlands was engaged in some form of sexual abuse of children, that the church board would want to have known what those allegations were and what was being done about them? In hindsight, absolutely. At that point of time, I... Uh, no. <clears throat> At any stage between 1987 and, 19, and December of 1992, did you inform the police of any of the allegations against uh, Mr no. Sanderlands? Did you seek their assistance in the investigation of any of the matters concerning any of the allegations made against Mr Sanderlands? No. Did you speak to the Department of Human Services on or those responsible within the government for child protection during that period to seek their advice about how to handle these allegations? I became aware that the school was doing that. I did not do it myself. Did you ask for the school to do that? No. <clears throat> did you receive any report from the school about that? No. Did you follow it up to determine whether the school had made um, any such attempts? I had no reason to do it. Because you had no concerns that um, his conduct was questionable in its um, effect upon children. Correct. Now, Ms Furlong gave evidence um, yesterday um, about an assembly that was called in about December of 1992 at which Mr Sanderland's retirement was announced. Um, do you recall that assembly at all? I was not there, no. Um, and she said it was represented to the, uh, to the assembly that Mr Sanderlands had retired because of his, um, his visual disability? I was not there, I do not know. Does that accord with your memory of what was announced to the, to the school community about his resignation? Okay, I, I cannot comment. I was not at that meeting, and I, I, I have no <coughs> recollection of what was said out to the... Community. All right. Now, in 1993, some further allegations were made <coughs> against Mr Sanderlands. Yes. And they were made by, um, first of all, AGC. You might want to check your pseudonym list there. Yes. And that Ms Lovell undertook a an investigation in the sense of interviewing um, that child, AGC, mm -hmm. and um, some others as well. Do you accept yes. that? And um, did you speak with AGC's father, who appears to have brought the allegations forward? I believe I've diarised those meetings, yes. Is that a diary that uh, you have today in the public hearing room? I think there is a record in the bundle. I, somewhere I had a, I saw uh, a memo to myself that there were, I think, four parents that had come to see me around that time. But I believe that was after Mr Sandler's had gone. I'm not too sure of the date. All right, well, I'll just... Um, um, we have a memorandum, it's uh, Tender Bundle 17, if that could be brought up. And if we just briefly go through it, that there were concerns about um, AGC's <laughs> behaviour at school and the concern from the father that there, was, there may have been some, um, some form of sexual abuse of his son... You understood that that was the uh, allegation, didn't you? I understand that I had not seen this report until this this time. So this is information, detail that's coming to me I did not have. I want you... Well, I'll go, I'll go to the next document and then come back to those details. 
Um, you'll see there's uh, a memorandum to diary dated the 13th of December 1993 at tab 18. So, Mr Sanderlands responded to a request to speak with you and came to the office at 2pm on the 14th of December 1993. Yes. So, this was a year after he'd left the school. Is that right? Um, I'm unsure the dates, but I'll say that would be correct. And you see at point three, DVS read the letter and explained the three allegations, and they were against... Um, AGR. AGR is AGC's father, um, and then AGE and AGX. You may wish to have a look at the Susan, no, please. Yeah, I understand that. You know who we're talking about there? I do now, yes. All right. And um, so you accept it was explained to you that there were allegations made um, against <laughs> three children? Yes. All right. Now, if we go back to tab 17, let's have a look at the allegations that concern AGC which were communicated by his father, at least to Ms Lovell, and then to Mr Rooks. And we can scroll down that page. We'll see that um, touching of AGC's genitals. Um, scroll down further, please. And then AG, Ken touching AGC's penis when he sat next to him. Um, Mr Sanderland's using the pretense of dropping and retrieving the paddle to touch AGC's penis. Do you see that? Yes. You go over the page. Um, Mr Sanderland's paddling another child in the back room and then placing his hand down the front of his pants, do you see that? Yes. And then putting his hand down the underpants of, an, of a further child in the next paragraph, do you see that? Yes. Um, and then Mr Sanderland's in the girls' toilets during the first part of lunchtime, kissing and cuddling um, AGY, do you see that? Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr Sanderland's closed and... AGY with a dress up and pants down, and so forth. Do you see that? Yes. So by the time we get to um, the next tab, Tender Bundle 18, this meeting on uh, the 14th of December 1993, we know that, sorry, you knew that there were allegations of genital touching by Mr Sanderlands of those three children. Is that right? No, that's incorrect. This is the first time I've seen that memo. I had no idea of those, the details of it. This is your memo to your diary. I was referring, I'm sorry, to the previous memorandum I had not seen before. This one I had. What were the allegations at point three? Basically... That, that you the, understood? I understood that the... Um, Allegation was the uh, at this stage that uh, Mr. Sandilands was indeed involved in something deeper than I had ever anticipated or expected or even understood could happen. And the conduct that was deeper was the touching of the genitals of these three children. I did not know that. Then I just. Are you, saying, are you saying that that previous memorandum with the explicit description of sexual abuse of children was not communicated to you by the 13th of December? I have not seen it until this time. That's not what I asked you. I'm asking you whether that, those allegations were communicated no, to you. I was not. What were the three allegations at point three that were communicated to you on the 13th of December? The allegation were that the, from memory, that the situation was in, improper, and I brought Ken Sandilands into it. But the actual details of it, I, I can't think of it was sufficient to know that they were uh, sexual abuse allegations. But the details were not mentioned to me. Pastor Smith, that's just rubbish, isn't it? 
all due respect, sir, no. You knew, you knew by the time of this meeting that serious sexual allegations had been made against Mr Sandlands involving three children. This is the time that I'm first meeting with parents in a, a formal way concerning these things, yes. And, and, I've re and, and I've recorded that. And are you saying that at this meeting the parents did not describe the explicit nature of the sexual abuse concerning those three children? I would be confident to say that it was nothing uh, as expressed in that previous memorandum. They would undoubtedly be expressing in, in the broader sense of the term, these aspects of sexual impropriety, yes. And are you saying that you did not ask them what the nature of the sexual impropriety was? I didn't have to, quite frankly, because regardless of what it was, it was, it was a sexual abuse allegation. And the details I did not need to get. <coughs> All right, so you... the principal had been corroborating this information with me. So n you agree that the allegations were of sexual abuse of those three children? Yes, as recorded by me. And you said Mr Sanderlands denied all allegations. Yes. Did you see that? Yes. Did you put the allegations in detail to him of the, that sexual abuse? I put the allegations of the parents to Mr Sanderlands and he vehemently denied them. Did you put them in detail to him? Not to those details as previously expressed. No. Why did you not put them to him in detail? Because I felt the fact that parents had come there uh, with the allegations was sufficient. I, I did not give him all the details. I said, these are sexual allegations against you. And he said, I deny them all. And he's denied them all. And that was the extent of your investigation? Yes, because the, uh, that was in collaboration with the principal and the committee that he'd appointed to work with this. And you requested a written response for him, from him, setting out that denial, is that right? Yes, I said, I'm not going to take your word, I want it in writing. And then, at, if we go over the page to paragraph 10, it's a recommendation to BOD, was that the, the, the board, board, of board of directors of the church? Yes. And um, the parents, you say that the following response was appropriate to give to the Board of Directors, is that right? That was the report for discussion at the Board, yes. No, is, was it not? Your recommendation to the Board of Directors? These were my words, yes. Yes. And that was your recommendation to the Board? Yes, for discussion. And the parent, it says the parents of children with allegations concerning the professional conduct of KS while a teacher at Northside Christian College be informed that we feel we have done all we can possibly do to ascertain the truth in this matter. Do you see that? Yes. At that stage, had you interviewed um, any of the three children concerned? No. Had you received a report about the interviewing of those children concerned? Only that it had happened, not the details. How did you form an opinion that um, all we can possibly do to ascertain the truth of the matter had been uh, undertaken? I was probably reflecting on the principal's recommendations to me that this is all we can do. Oh, you say, so this all comes from the principal, does not it? Not necessarily. This recommendation comes from me. Now, you understand that there was, uh, that um, the allegations, I think you said earlier, involved allegations of sexual abuse of three children. You agree with that, don't yes. you? And you knew in uh, December of 1993 that such conduct was likely to be criminal conduct. I think that the 
That concept was still evolving, but certainly criminal, yes. And that's speaking why as a did layman, you, not as a professional. Why did you not, at that point in time, refer these matters to the police? Because fundamentally I believe that it was the parents' responsibility over their children to do what they felt was appropriate to that. Hence, they were given a copy of the letter. As it turned out, they were given the full letter. Um, so, and, and were advised that when it came to the future decisions that they would make, it is theirs to make because they had the ultimate and the highest authority. Is there anything in that recommendation to the board of directors or to the parents which indicates to them that they should take the matter to the police? I think one of them mentioned that they would. I said, that is your privilege. There is nothing there at all at point 10 of the memorandum that mentions the police, is there? Correct. You did not at any stage suggest to any of the parents of these three children that the matter be referred to the police? The matter was raised by at least one parent I'm aware of. That I can recall that he would be taking the matter to the police and I affirmed that that is his privilege. Did you support him in Absolutely. that? Absolutely. And how did you, you did that orally, did you, in a conversation with him? I did that orally, and when it actually happened and when the police came, we freely made available all the information we had concerning the situation. Well, in, in 2000... Which is, is when it happened. Is yes. that what you're referring to? Well, that's if the record shows, yes. Well, this record is in relation to 1993, some seven years earlier. Does that affect your answer? When you're speaking of this record? This record, the one that's on the screen? The one that's on the screen, yes, that's at that stage, yes. And at that stage, that was the, with the information I had and the input I had from the, from the principal of the school and so, and so forth was what I had come to a decision on. Now, in hindsight, I have to agree, I would have taken matters differently, but as I faced the situation there, that's the recommendation I made to the board for their discussion. I have no knowledge Pastor that Smith, you, changed. you understood in December, and Jan in December 1993 and January 1994 that these were allegations of child sexual abuse of children at the school by a teacher at the school, didn't you? Yes, they were allegations, yes. And if those allegations were to be made public, that that would be disastrous for the church and for the school? My first responsibility would be toward the families of the children rather than that. that Did you... Yes, it, it would have an effect, yes. More than an effect, it would have been disastrous for the reputation of both the church and the school. They're your words, not mine. You don't agree with that? I would not go to disastrous because I think that the church has passed through lots of challenges over its existence and has come through. Well, you said you used the word effect. You said it would have an effect. Well, it would have a very serious effect it upon the indeed. reputation of the uh, school. I stand by what I, what I, the recommendation I made, yes. And the recommendation was that the parents be advised that they are free to pursue the matter with... Mr. Sanderlands, if they wish to do so. Which is part of the parental responsibility that we believe. Well, let's turn to the church's responsibility. At that point, you were saying that the church had no further responsibility to deal with the allegations of child sexual abuse made against Mr. Sanderlands. That was the advice I received. Well, not only was it, if it was the advice you received, it was the it was the proposal that you put to the board of directors for that to occur, wasn't it? Indeed, I felt we had done all we could at that time. Yes. And if we go to um, tender bundle twenty one, we'll see at the bottom of that page, um, confidential report to the board of directors, point six allegations. Teaching staff, this is in relation to Mr. Sanderlands, isn't it? Yes. You say that the final thing, I do not believe there is anything further we can do at the moment. You see that? 
Yes. So effectively, that brought the matter to an end. At the moment, is not an end. It was not concluding it, but at that specific moment in time. All right. Now, you provided there in your... This is your report to the Board of Directors. Um, you provided that short report together with a copy of Mr Sanderland's... Um, Mr Sanderland's denial of the allegations. His letter, yes. But you hadn't provided to the Church Board a detailed indication of what the allegations were, had you? Except to say that they would have been sexual allegations. Well, it doesn't say that in this report, does it? Indeed, it does not. Are you no, saying no. that you told the board there, in your oral report to the board, that these were sexual allegations? Undoubtedly, I would have discussed the matter, yes. After, in 1993, I should say, um, did, were you still occupying the position of senior pastor of, um, of the church? In 93, yes, I think I was. And did you continue in that role until 1998? Uh, but I handed it over to my associate, yes. To uh, Pastor Spinella, is that yeah. right? Yes. And then after 1998, you remained on the, on the church board? At the request of the board, yes. And... Um, you became aware in 2000 that um, proceedings had been commenced um, in the courts by a number of former students from Northside Christian College. Yes. And they related to sexual abuse of um, Mr. S by Mr. Sanderland of them. Yes. Now, um, and you were joined in those proceedings. That is to say, you were named as a named defendant. The yes. Were you separately represented from um, from the church? To my knowledge, no. I was instructed to pass over all the information to the church solicitor, who would be guiding from that moment on. And the and uh, did you provide in instructions to the church solicitor? I believe on one occasion I was, or two occasions, I was instructed by the solicitors to send a letter uh, requesting the return of the original documentation and a second one. I'm not too sure of the details now. And um, uh, it was determined that... Uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll just clarify that position. So um, there were, uh, I think, up to eight writs that were issued against um, the school and against you? Is, does that uh, occur with I, your memory? I cannot tell you the number, no. All right, but there were a number of them, weren't there? Were there were a number of them which I right. passed on unopened, which was the instructions I received. And you were you were not represented yourself at any stage during that process? I'm unaware that I was. No, no one ever spoke to me concerning it. Right. Correct. Did you in, were you involved in um, the mediations which occurred with respect to, I think, um, six, perhaps seven of the... Uh, no, I... I had left the church by that time. Excuse me? I had left the church by that time. I think um, the date I have that you uh, handed your resignation in was the 7th of November 2001. You recall when you resigned, I presume? Yes, I was aware that the allegations were happening because the solicitor came and attended the board meeting to inform us. Of the situation. There were mediations that occurred in September of 2001, about two months before you left. I was unaware of those. All right. Did, you, didn't, you didn't attend any of no. those? No. All right. Oh, Your Honour, I noticed the time. I think I'll probably be another 10 or 15 minutes with this one. Thank you. We'll take the lunch in adjournment now, Pastor Smith, until Thank 2. You. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, Pastor, Pastor Pickett. Thank you. Pastor Smith, um, I wonder if I can just take you back to uh, one of the documents that I raised with you earlier today, namely um, a handwritten memorandum of... Twenty-four March, 1987. So first of all, if uh, Tender Bundle 6 could come up, please. So you recall this was the, uh, the memorandum that Mr Rooks <coughs> had, yes. had sent to you um, concerning the allegations of uh, him having female students on his knee and touching on the lower stomach and legs. You recall that? Yes. And um, various other matters mentioned there. Now, if we go over to Tender Bundle 7, your response to that memorandum, as I understand it, is to um, ask Mr. Ingram, sorry, Pastor Ingram and Mr. Rooks to investigate. Is that right? Correct. And uh, you say in that second paragraph, I am very concerned with the report and with you. With and wish you and wish you to treat it with great seriousness and urgency. And, great ur and urgency. Yes. You see that? Yes. What was the seriousness and urgency in Serious. your mind? Well, the urgency was asking him to get onto it quickly. The seriousness was the matter that uh, it had the connotations of being serious and to properly investigate it. Uh, was that because it had connotations of child sexual abuse? No, because the, the whole thing had the overtones of being improper and the potential probably would have existed then, yes. The pot potential probably existed that, that it may have been child sexual abuse? Although that thought never entered my mind, it was sufficient to notice or to note that it needed... <coughs> that it was sufficient for me to respond to the principal that... I needed a fuller report of the investigation, by an investigation. But just specifically, what was, what was the seriousness of the allegations that con caused you to call for that urgent investigation? The seriousness was that a, the principal was sharing information with me which had the overtones of, as, as you said before, of sexual impropriety. So you agree now that you understood in March 1987 that this conduct had sexual overtones? The potential for it, yes. Earlier today, uh, Pastor Smith, I thought you indicated to the to the Royal Commission that that, that behaviour did not have any sexual connotations. That's what I was informed of. Yes. After the investigation. After the investigation, but I'm talking about at the time that the allegations arose. Are you saying that your evidence now is that it did have sexual connotations then, at the stage of the allegations? My thoughts but would later, be that, sorry. but later, it was established that there were no such connotations. I saw that it had the potential for sexual overturns, and when I received the report back from the principal and those involved with it, they reported back to me that it was not uh, of that nature. Yes. So. It was in your mind in March of 1987 that that contact, that contact with children by Mr Sanderlands may have some form of sexual connotation. It possibly existed, yes. Um, so in October 1987, when he breached the guidelines again, did you consider whether that conduct, the cuddling of children, may also have had sexual connotations? I did not consider that by virtue of the information given to me at that time. Right. Well, just coming to the end of the period, um, let's see. Um, in 2001, this is um, about the time that um, you resigned, do you recall 
there being um, a board meeting where your position on the board was considered? Yes. And so the case isn't it that the senior pastor at that stage, John Spinella, had taken a detailed report about the allegations concerning Mr Sandland's the criminal conviction and the civil proceedings to the board. I have no knowledge of that report. You were not present at that, uh, so... When that report was presented, I, I was not there now. All right. In fact, um, if the first page of tab 68 could come up, please. You'll see the um, board paper that I'm referring to is annexed to these minutes, and um, we have you noted it as an apology. Do you see that? Indicating I was not present, yes. Yes. Was there any reason that you didn't go to that particular board meeting? By request. Why did you request not to go? It was not my request. The request came from the chairman. Are you saying that Pastor John Spinella asked that you not attend the meeting? Correct. And why was that? He had his reasons. What were you told? I was told not to worry about attending the meeting. For the actual date, I don't know whether I was away at that time in Queensland or not. I may have been in Queensland, I'm not sure. Are you aware that at about that time, uh, sorry, that I, I withdraw that, are you aware that the, um, that the board report provided by uh, Pastor Sp Spinella included adverse comments made against your handling of allegations against Mr Sanderland while no, he was there? I had no knowledge of that report. Were you, did you know at about that time that he considered that you had completely bungled um, the church and the school's response to um, allegations against Ken Sanderland? That was never conveyed to me. Are you aware that subsequently, sorry, I withdraw that, are you aware that a decision was taken at that meeting, and I'll, I'll show it to you, Tender Bundle 69, these are the minutes of the Board of Directors of the Church, dated the 7th of November 2001. And if we go down to the second page, there's discussion of the, uh, of the case at, point, at um, 6.3 and then at 6.4 refers to the implications. Do you see that? Yes. Have you seen these minutes before? No. You see at the very bottom of the page, if we could just scroll down a bit further, please. It says, further that the senior pastor communicate to Dennis Smith, the board of directors grave concerns about the present and possible future action against the college, church and Dennis himself, and that Dennis Smith be given an opportunity to consider his present position in the light of this information. Do you see that? Yes. And um, is this the first time that you've read that particular provision? The, the context of that was relayed to me in a letter. All right. Um, we don't seem to have a copy of that letter. Do you have a copy of it? I don't, no. Did you then have a conversation with um, Pastor Spinella about your continuing, continuing involvement with the church board? With the church, yes. And uh, did he indicate to you something about your position there? In the church, yes. Yes, and what did he say? That I should consider myself in, the, in uh, my position in the church. Yes. Well, that's just, that's effectively a euphemism or code for saying you should resign, isn't it? Not really, because the initial response came from me to the to him that uh, as I became aware of the financial liability that was coming possibly coming to the church and a loan it was I was informed that a loan had to be taken out I said well the easiest way to address that loan is for, is to use my salary so I will resign and the 
that portion of the budget can be used against the loan. And so that's what you did? Yes. So as far as you knew, the, as you know, then and now, your resignation was a, a financial measure to assist the church in paying for um, the civil proceedings against the church by those who had been abused by Ken Sanders. From my perspective, yes. And did uh, <clears throat> Pastor John Spinella say anything to you about the way in which you had handled the allegations about Mr Sanderlands in the period that he was at the school? No. Did he uh, indicate to you at all that you'd been negligent or had failed to act properly with respect to those allegations? That was never communicated. So as far as you knew, you left the church board um, without knowing whether there was any criticism from the board of uh, your conduct in handling the Sanderlands allegations? Yes. Did you subsequently become aware of uh, any criticism of you? I became aware of a, a letter of communication from the board thanking me for my service and I think quoting something like the board were assured had I actually known this would have happened there would be no hesitation that I would have sacked Mr Sandlins. So that was the communication that was given to me. Yes, I might ask Mr Spinella about that. Um, sir, I understand that uh, from uh, your legal representative, Mr Pratt, that, uh, um, that you have a, a short <coughs> statement, one page, that you wanted, you wanted to read out. Do you have that with you? With your permission. With, um, with Her Honour's permission. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Please go ahead. With your yes. permission, please. I, I've written it out. Um, rather than just trust my words. On, the, on reflection of the information provided through the Commission, I've learned of the harm caused by Mr Sandlins to many children at the college. I am deeply saddened by what I've learned of the harm suffered and of the deceit perpetrated by Mr Sandlins. It is my real hope and prayer that all those who have been affected by this tragedy will find a future hope for their lives. I'll leave it at that if I may. Uh, Pastor Smith, um, I wonder if um, at any stage after Mr Sanderlands left Northside Christian College, you've provided an apology to any one of Mr Sanderland's victims? I did not know any of the victims. Uh, during, uh, did you, I'm sorry, withdraw that. You were aware that there were criminal proceedings against him? Yes, but I was unaware of the names of the people involved. Did you make any attempts to approach the police to tell them that you, you would like to make an apology on behalf of yourself or the church? I do not believe I was in a position to do that. Why not? because of legal proceedings that were there in which I had no real knowledge of what was happening. After, this, after the civil... Sorry, I withdraw that. You, you said you were aware of the civil proceedings which commenced in about 2000. Basically, the information was coming to me which I was passing on to the church. Did you ever say to the church's lawyers or indeed to Pastor Spinella at that stage that you were willing to provide an apology on your own behalf or on behalf of the... Uh, the church? I did not have that conversation, no. Again, because I was unaware of the outcomes. Did you make an offer to any of those victims or to the school or to the church that you were prepared to provide such an apology to the victims of Mr Sanderland? I did not at that time. So do you consider you bear any level of responsibility for the abuse of children by Mr Sanderlands at Northside Christian College? In hindsight, yes. And why do you bear that responsibility? Because of the outcomes that have been tabled. Again, it's a case of 2020 vision. Had I known this, I would have acted differently. Do you accept that you made any errors of judgment in 
handling the allegations about Mr Sanderlands during the time that he was at the school? I believe I followed all the recommendations provided to me by the educational experts of the, of the college and followed through to the best of my ability. So do I take it that the level of regret is, because, is more to do with not having been provided with information of child sexual abuse by Mr Sanderlands during the time that he was at the school? Well, there was regret for the hurt that came to the children. Yes, those are my questions. Ms McGlinchey. Pastor Smith, my name is Ms McGlinchey. I represent Emma Freton in these um, matters. Um, I just want to cover one um, aspect of Ms Freton's evidence with you. Uh, in your attendance at the school council meetings, do you remember any occasions when children attended those meetings? No. Uh, is it possible that there were occasions when children attended the meetings? I know of no occurrence where that happened. All right. Uh, do you recall any meetings that you were part of with other adults uh, where Emma Fretton was um, present talking about the allegations? No, I, I did not know her and I could not identify her. All right. You've never had a conversation with no. her about the allegations at no. all? What about any other children at all? No. Thank you. That's my questions. So I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Mr. Pratt. Just a couple. Thank you. <coughs> so Reverend Smith, uh, Principal Rooks was uh, appointed by you as principal yes. of the college. What what type of principal was he? My personal opinion is he was the, one of the most outstanding persons in that role I've ever seen. Was he a uh, a person that you kept a trust uh, in his ability to advise you appropriately as you... Without hesitation. You were shown a... Uh, a memo from March of Docking 6 uh, is the memorandum uh, relevant to the incident of March 1987. Thank you. Yes. Was it your understanding on reading that document that uh, the main concern that uh, Mr Rooks had was the cuddling of the child. Yes. But you've just expressed to Mr Beckett that your memo subsequent to that was that you were concerned there may have been a, a potential for a sexual overtone, is that right? I presume that is more in hindsight than the, the, the time I actually wrote this. Right. Can we just scroll up there, please? It's this memorandum, if you look at the second last paragraph there, where Mr Rooks talks about In the future, his lack of hesitation to recommend instant suspension or dismissal if that was to be proof undeniable of inappropriate conduct. That's correct? Exactly, yes. Okay. All right. In 19, subsequently, in 1987, there was a further report to you in the October... Did that report come with Mr Rooks's recommendation of suspension or dismissal? There was no recommendation. Right. And again in 1991, which is the next occasion you are informed of any allegation against Mr Sandlins, 
correct? There was no recommendation then either. At that point, there was no recommendation? Yes, that's true. The, uh, can we see document 19, please? The chronology. Thank you. The chronology that's on the screen is is uh, one drafted by Mr. Rooks. Yes. Does the chronology of the allegations, the number of uh, allegations that he has recorded there, accord with your recollections of the allegations brought to your attention? I would say yes. Some of the details I was unaware of, but generally yes. So with that chronology there, uh, Mr Rooks is reporting uh, that there are issues from 1986 to 1987 uh, and then a break until 1991, 92 and 93. Yes. They're the allegations that you were aware of? Not during that time, no. no. They were the ones that were brought to your attention by Mr Rooks? Only the ones that were brought to my attention. Correct. So we and were correct in saying that, therefore, no allegations were brought to your attention between October of 1987 and August of 1991? That is correct. So, in 1991, there's a breach of a guideline that was imposed in 1987 brought up. Yes. But is it correct that, from your perspective, this is the first time in four years that such a breach has been raised with you? That is correct. You've spoken, Priest, about being reliant upon the educators such as Rooks in this proceedings. In that capacity uh, and reflecting upon his memo of March 1987, was it your view that if Rooks held a belief that Mr Sandlin's should have been instantly suspended or dismissed, he would have had no hesitation recommending that to you? Yes. We just get a document ten, please. Okay, just scroll back down, please. No, no, sorry. Go to the top, please. Uh, this is a document that uh, Mr. Becker took you to before. Uh, it's the minutes of meeting of Northside Christian College Executive Council. Yes. Could you just explain to us what the Executive Council was? Because the College was going through a, a building phase and the Council, the full Council was unable to meet when required, the Council appointed an Executive Council to handle the matters that needed immediate attention. And that was this group? Yes, myself, Pastor Ingram, Mr Rooks, the Principal, and Mr Laurie else, who was then the person. And you were asked previously whether the issue of Mr Sandlands should have been raised at this meeting. Is it your view that it should have been? No, for two reasons. One, these people would have known about it, and two, that wasn't the major purpose of this executive committee. Just picking up on the first point of that, the personalities who were present at that meeting were yourself, Pastor Ingram, Neil Rooks and Mr Ellis. It's correct, isn't it, that it, as of May of 1987, all of those people were well aware of the allegations that have been raised in March of 1987 regarding Mr Sandlins? I would say yes. Given that situation, would you agree that it would be unnecessary for that issue to be 
on an agenda for that meeting or raised in that meeting? Yes. You was asked before regarding the response that you provided to the board or the recommendation provided to the board in 1993 concerning the allegations of AGR and subsequent parents. Would you agree that that response could now be more fulsome? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you agree that the response that you provided to the board at that time there, the recommendation, perhaps could have been a little more expansive than it was? In hindsight, definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pratt. Your Honour, uh, th there's something that's uh, arisen um, out of the evidence that's been given by Mr. Smith uh, that wasn't contained in any statements that we've sought some instructions from Mr. Spinella on. Um, and perhaps in the interests of fairness, it's really a brown and done type point. Um, it should be put to uh, Mr. Smith, and I'll seek leave to do that now if that's appropriate. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, my name's Bird, and I appear for the Northside Church and College. Um, you've given evidence in respect to some of the discussions you had with uh, Pastor Spinella. You've said uh, that. There was a letter. Do you recall that? A letter from him? Yeah. That, that would be the best recollection I have, yes. Uh, he will say uh, there was no letter from him, um, but in fact, after that board meeting, what occurred is that he went around to your place to see you. Do you recall that? I think I do, yes. And it's during uh, that meeting that uh, he's outlined the situation to you that's been outlined in the notes of the board meeting. Do you recall that? I do not recall all those details, no. He says uh, the meeting went for about 20 minutes. Would that be right? I have to take his information. And that during the meeting, what is essentially being said by Pastor Spinella to you is that following the mediations, um, it's become very clear uh, that there's a lot of anger towards the way you have handled the allegations of sexual abuse by Mr Sandilands. Do you agree with that? I agree that I've only just read that information for the first time in this report. I was unaware of that. That he had that discussion with you about that? Do you agree with that? I do not recall that and that he has suggested to you during that discussion that the most appropriate thing for you to do would be to resign. At that point of time, possibly yes, but it was probably a month or so before that that I had intimated to him that I would be prepared to resign to free up the finances of the church. Do you remember uh, Pastor Spinella, Senior Pastor Spinella, talking to you at this meeting following the board meeting at your home asking you to resign, that it would be in the best interests of everyone if you resigned? Yes, and my, my memory was I thought it came in the letter, but apparently it didn't. OK. And that as a result of that, you did something to the effect of shrugged your shoulders and said, I suppose that's what I'll have to do then. And that's not my style, no. What do you say? I, I accepted that that was the situation and uh, made the arrangements to announce to the church that I was leaving and uh, he responded formally at that meeting that I was doing that and that was the end of it. And uh, do you agree with this that uh, you sent a letter of resignation following that discussion with Senior Pastor Spinella? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you have a copy of that letter? Not with me, no. OK. Thank you, Your Honour. Mr Beckett. <clears throat> Nothing arising. 
Pastor Smith, did you consider that unfair of the board to request your resignation? That was the way the church was constituted, Your Honour. It had, it had the right and the privilege to do that. And that was basically part of my contract. I could give the church board three months' notice of leaving and they could give me three months' notice of leaving. That's, that's the structure that and the structure procedure that and, and powers of the board. Yes. But I'm asking you something different. I'm asking you, did you consider that unfair upon no, be, you? Because I had made the decision before that to resign. And I recognised that that was the decision of the board and I was quite prepared to go along with it, considering that my leaving would release the finance. So... That was my prime motive. You didn't consider it unfair? No. Did you understand why the board was asking you to do to um, tender your resignation? At that time, no. So Except what was re referred to me verbally and what I have since seen in documentation that I have not seen before. What did you understand was the reason why you were being asked to tender your resignation? Well, the words that we used there, Your Honour, were to consider my position. And evidently, I became aware that my being there was creating some problem for the church in, in that global sense. And so my first response was to willingly leave the church to, so that the church could continue into its future. Anything arising out of that for anyone? No, no. Mr. Bird. Thank you, Pastor Smith. Thank you for your attendance and Thank you are otherwise right. excused. I call Pastor John Spinella. Do you, you wish to take an oath? Can you repeat after me, please? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Pastor. If you just replace the Bible and take a seat, please, where you are. I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. John Spanella. And uh, you've provided your um, work address to the Royal Commission, is that correct? That's correct. And you've provided the Royal Commission with a detailed statement. I don't have that. Uh, So I apologise, Your Honour. I actually have an uh, unsigned copy of this statement. Yes. Um, did you provide a statement dated the 17th of September 2014 to the Royal Commission? That is correct. And um, are there any corrections you wish to make to that statement? No. Is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. I tendered the statement. 18.0023. Now, uh, Pastor, I understand that you joined Northside Christian Centre um, in January of 1987, is that right? That's correct. And you were an assistant pastor for Seven. six years from 1987? Yes, that is true. Um, and then became an associate pastor from 1994 to 1998? That's what happened. Um, from 1987 to 1989, you taught religious education at the college? Yes. Um, did that mean that you... Oh, sorry, I withdraw that. How many days a week were you um, at the school? It was only one or two periods uh, a week, which is 45 minutes. 
And the college and the church are located in the same um, block of land, aren't they? Yes, they are. And um, you would just come across from the church to teach those particular classes, is that right? Yes, that's right. And, and then you ceased doing that in 1989, is that right? Yes. Um, and did you have anything to do with the college in 1990? No. Um, and then, according to uh, your statement, you were, appoint you were appointed to the church board in November of 1991. That is correct. And then in the following year, in 1992, um, you sat on the college council. Is that right? That's the best of my recollection. All right. So during that period from 1987 to 1989, maybe if we just take that period when you were teaching... Yes. Uh, did you have much to do with Mr Sanderlands? Not at all. Um, you knew who he was? I recognised him by sight, yes. Did you go into his classroom at all? Not at all. Did you see him about the school? I would have seen him at the prayer meetings in the, in the morning. Did you see him interacting with children at the college? No. And then um, you took up your position, I think you said, in November of 1991 on the church board. Is that right? That's correct. Were you, um, were you replacing Pastor Ellis? That would have been Laurie Ellis. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I couldn't say. That was the reason I was uh, on the board. I don't think so because I think that Laurie Ellis was still on the college council in 1993-94. That's from what I understand. All right, now... Um, <clears throat> I understand, first of all, from, um, I think, paragraph 46, if that could come up, please, of your statement. It's on ringtail 9... nine. You'll see a paragraph 46 there. You've set out um, a number of people involved with both the church and the school who had children who were in Mr Sanderland's class. Is that right? That's correct. And I think I counted 12 board members and members of either the college council or teachers who had children in Mr Sanderland's class from 1985 through to 1992. Does it sound right? That sounds right. And no doubt those people would have been concerned about um, their children um, and the welfare of their children. Yes. And indeed you had one of your two daughters who was in Mr Sanderland's class in 1992, is that right? That was my eldest daughter, yes. All right, so I'll just take you to the first meeting that you attended of the church board, which is in November of 1991. Um, I don't suppose you recall that particular meeting. <laughs> Just have it brought up. And it's tab eleven. And we see at the second page there appointments dash board of directors. The actions of the senior minister to appoint Gary Emerson and John Spinella to the board of directors until the next AGM be endorsed. Sorry, that'll come up on the second page, please. See 5.2 there? Yes, I do. So your note is being present on that occasion with, uh, with Pastor Smith in the chair. Yes, that's, that'd be true. All right. Now... There's certainly nothing in these minutes which indicates any report from Pastor Smith about concerns about Mr Sanderland at that stage. There was nothing. And were you told by Pastor Smith, 
sorry, I'll withdraw that. Now, as far as we can work out, this is the first meeting since about June of 1991 of the church board. Do you accept that that's the case? Yes, I do. And in August and September, certain allegations arose against Mr Sandlands, um, which were resolved by a rebuke. I think you probably heard the evidence earlier today. Um, but that Mr Sandlands was allowed to, to continue teaching at the school. Um, but in any event, none of that was communicated to you when, at about the time that you joined the board. It was never brought up. Um, in, in 1991, was it ever mentioned to you that there were concerns about Mr Sandlands' behaviour? Not at the board, no. And until the end of 1992, when he resigned, was there any... Were you aware of any allegations made against Mr Sandlands? I was not. Um, in those two years that Mr Sandlands was um, at the school and you were on the church board, were you ever told about guidelines having been sent, set for Mr Sandlands in 1987 about his behaviour? I, I was not told. I only read them when I was going through the documents, just recently. Um, as a member of the church board from November of 1991, uh, allegations that may have indicated sexual abuse by a pastor of a child at the college, something that you would have expected to be reported to the board? Absolutely. It's a and why, is it? why was that? Very significant. It's a very significant disciplinary problem. It was also an expectation that uh, disciplinary issues are brought to the board, which are of, of a significant nature. I would have expected that. Um, at that stage, was it the case that such matters were dealt with really by the principal and didn't need to be taken to the board? I still would have expected it to come to the board. All right. Now, there are... Consideration given to Mr Sandland's con continuation at the school in November of 1992 and December of 1992. Do you recall there being some discussion at that period um, of Mr Sandland's future at the school? Sorry, can you just repeat that again? Yeah, sorry, I've asked you a long question. Yes. Um, I'll take you to Tender Bundle 89, if that could come up. These are the board minutes from 16th of November 1992. And if you just stroll down to the part concerning Mr Sandlands. <coughs> You see there that um, this, uh, <clears throat> this is part of a, a board report from the senior pastor concerning Mr Sandland. Yeah. And uh, in the normal course, you would have received such a report? Yes, I would And um, mentions there a comprehensive med medical report regarding his visual impairment. Yes. And you recall the concern being at that stage whether he was sufficiently able to undertake his duties as a teacher at the school because of that visual impairment? Yes, that came up at the board. It was something that was uh, well known. Uh, his visual impairment was well known. And um, so there was a process in, in, in place for considering what, uh, what his future might be at the college? Correct. And if we go over to Tender Bundle 19, the entry for... Sorry, let me draw that. Um, excuse me for a moment. Yeah, so tender bundle fifteen could come up. 
And then there was a further confidential report to the board. If we go down to the next page, point 19. You'll see that there was uh, that uh, Passer Smith indicated that the information had been received, and um, the principal had been instructed to evaluate the medical report and make a recommendation. Do you see that? Yes. Um, so, do you recall receiving this report or something like it in, in December of 1992? I do. What was your understanding in December 1992? particularly taking into account what you learnt at board meetings as to why Mr Sanderlands was leaving the school? He was purely on grounds of uh, his eyesight, um, impairment, physical impairment, uh, that was being continually evaluated. Did uh, Pastor Smith ever indicate to you or to the board in 1992 that there were concerns about his behaviour towards children? Not at all. Did he ever indicate that there were allegations that may have been construed as child sexual abuse? No. Um, did you hear the evidence earlier about allegations made um, by AGC's father, AGR, concerning genital touching and so forth in about December of 1993? I did hear it, yes. Yes. Um, Casting your mind back to December of 1993, were you aware of those um, of those specific allegations in your position as a board member? Absolutely not. Let's be clear. I'll take you to Tender Bundle 17. And if you just scroll towards the bottom of that first page. Actually, you could stop there. The, um, have you ever seen this memorandum from Kerry Lovell to Neil Rooks, dated the 29th of November 1993? I have seen it, but only when I was reading through the, all the documents. All right. And if we scroll to the bottom, you'll see there are allegations there of genital touching by Mr Sandlands involving a number of boys, including AGC. Yes. And then if we go over the page... The uh, genital touching um, of a number of other boys and a girl uh, set out there. Do you see that? Yes, I do. In December of 1993, were you aware of these allegations? Absolutely not. Um, if you go to the next page, Tender Bundle 18. According to this, um, Pastor Smith had a meeting with Ken Sanderlands on the 14th of December 1993, yeah. um, in which he raised the allegations with Mr Sanderlands. Yes. Um, were you aware that such a meeting had taken place? I was not aware. Um, were you aware of any denials by Mr Sanderlands that the that um, such allegation that such acts had taken place. No, not at all. Well, I'm going to take you to Tender Bundle 21. You'll see it's a confidential report to the Board of Directors of Northside Christian Centre dated December 93 to January 1994. So you were still a board member at that stage. I was. And normally speaking, you would obtain a copy of such reports? Correct. Normally speaking, that would be the case. There would be sometimes, if it was a, a highly confidential board report, it might be handed, uh, handed out to members at the meeting. All right. Um, are you aware of this particular document? I am aware of it now. Yes. And if you scroll down, you'll see it, um, point six, allegations teaching staff. You'll see there that there's reference to the matter being pursued with the person concerned and Pastor Smith receiving a letter from him denying all allegations. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then there's notification of the, the State Superintendent 
uh, and that the principal has spoken with the three families concerned. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And a, a further statement that I do not believe there is anything further we can do at the moment from Pastor Smith. Do you see that? Now, having read that, do you recall receiving <coughs> this particular document in December or January 1994? To the best of my recollection, I do not remember this document. Do you remember any discussions at about that time of allegations against um, Mr Sanderlands, particularly allegations of child sexual abuse? I've tried to go back, and this has been something I've thought about quite a lot, I've tried to go back to that time, and I cannot remember being part of this board meeting. I've tried to look at the agenda, what's been discussed, to the best of my knowledge, I cannot remember being part of that. All right. I mean, they're pretty explosive allegations that you've heard today in the Royal Commission, aren't they? They are. And you'd expect to, uh, uh, to given their severity and the litigation that followed, mm -hmm. the reputational effect upon the school, yes. you'd certainly remember them if... Um, oh, you know, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Now, do you think it was the case that Pastor Smith did not provide you with a copy of this confidential report? That could be a distinct possibility if I was not present at the board meeting. It's the only, it's the only way I can uh, have of explaining why I'm not aware of this. Um, do you recall other instances where Pastor Smith kept um, such confidential reports from you? All I can say is that from time to time, if it was something of a really confidential nature, he wouldn't send it out. He could, he would give it at the meeting, and then he wouldn't send it out by post. If, if a person, would, uh, he would just, we would simply receive the minutes of that meeting. All right. Um, yeah. Casting your mind back to both the time when you were uh, teaching religious education at Northside Christian College, <coughs> and then when you uh, joined. Um, the church board in 1991 and also the college council in 1992. Did you, were you able to witness firsthand the relationship between Neil Rooks and Pastor Smith? Yes, I was. And what was the nature of that relationship? Both of them are very strong characters. There is no doubt that Pastor Smith was the leader he was the leader of the church. He was, even though um, Neil Rooks was the principal, still he reported to Dennis Smith. But both of them were competent leaders. That's what I remember. Uh, in your dealings, as a, in those positions in the church board and the college council, did you think that uh, Dennis Smith deferred to Neil Rooks? In operational matters, I would say yes, but in major decisions, I would say no. So matters involving um, allegations <coughs> against um, a teacher, which, which category would they fall, fall into of those two? Yes, I, I would say that is a significant matter that uh, Dennis Smith would have uh, overseen. And if, um, if Pastor Smith didn't agree with a recommendation from Mr Rooks, would that... Um, was he, was he likely to accept the recommendation or was he likely to take action to reconsider the recommendation? I think, I think Pastor Smith always made his uh, feelings and decisions uh, very clear. Uh, he wouldn't be somebody to uh, take something that, that was against his will uh, on board. He would think about it and it would be his decision. Right. Now, are you able to assist the Royal Commission at all by indicating why Pastor Smith would not have, or sorry, did not raise the allegations against Mr Sanderlands at the board level? I don't know. I, I cannot say why he did not. Did he express to you that he was concerned about the reputation of the church or the college? No, not at any time in regards to this. Right. Was he aware that a number of the board members had children who had been or were in Mr Sanderland's class? He would have known. 
That was common knowledge at the time, wasn't it? Yes, that would have been co common knowledge. All right. Now, um, you say in your statement that uh, paragraph 48 and onwards that um, you don't recall receiving an allegation of sexual abuse or any allegation for that matter um, against Mr Sanderlands by AGF or AGE, her mother. Sorry, the other way around. AGF, the mother, or AGE, the daughter. That's correct. Um, when was the first time you heard of any allegations against Mr Sanderlands involving abuse of AGE? The only time I heard about the allegations is when uh, when it came to receiving um, writs and then also when there was a, a police investigation in the year 2000. And that slowly evolved in, into knowing who uh, had actually been abused. Before that time, I did not know. So you've now been, had an opportunity to review all of the uh, documentation that was available regarding Mr Sanderlands that was at the school in that period 1986 through to 1992, haven't you? I have. As, oh, much, indeed. As, I, as much as I can. Yeah. Yes. In any event, by the end of 1993, you'd been provided with none of that material. Is not that at all. And you were not aware of any of the allegations against Mr Sanderlands? Correct. So I presume when the when the writ arrived, were you taken by surprise? Absolutely shocked, disappointed, saddened that this had happened in our school. Um, and um, you said out there at paragraph 63 the the approach to responding to the claims. Now, do I take it first of all that you determined to do? The, sorry, I withdraw that, that the, the church, together with the insurer, determined to do what it could to settle the claims? We did. Um, did you get as far as filing defences in, um, in any of these proceedings? Basically, it was all handed over to the insurers and they took charge. Right. Was there, any ever dis was there ever any discussion about a conflict of interest between the school and Dennis Smith um, in the litigation? No, there wasn't. Actually. Was there any consideration that Dennis Smith might be separately represented from from the church? That never came up. All right. Was the church happy to accept um, liability for the actions of Dennis Smith in handling the allegations against Mr. Mr. Sandland? You used the word happy. We accepted the fact that he was an employer, employee of the of the church, and as such, uh, the church had liability. You didn't consider uh, cross claiming against uh, Pastor Smith to obtain some part of the uh, the the ultimate sum from him. No, it, the as the mediation took place, it became clearer in our mind what had, what had actually happened and the extent to which um, Pastor Smith or Dennis Smith had been uh, involved or had not acted uh, appropriately. Right, I'll come to some of that in, in detail. Um, during the process of uh, settlement and mediation of the, the civil proceedings, was did you ever request um, some form of financial contribution from Pastor Smith to pay for um, a share of the amount to be provided to the plaintiffs? No, we did not. Why was that the case? We just didn't. Yes. We didn't think of it, to be honest. Right. Now, um, 
You say that uh, there were joint mediations conducted on two days, namely the 24th and 25th of September of 2001. Is that right? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Last Paragraph 65 of your statement, you refer to um, two days in which joint mediations were conducted. Correct. Um, there's been some evidence given in the, in the Royal Commission that the mediations took place over a five-day period. Are you aware of that at all? I know that we were uh, we were in the city, and, um, and for a number of days, I can't recall the the, the amount of days, but it was certainly more than more than two or three. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it could have been that there were additional days, not just these two days in which um, uh, you say the mediations were conducted. Is that right? It's a long time ago. But... It also appears to have been a long time over which, and that is to say, the mediation seemed to have taken a, quite a long time yes. in the scheme of things. Would you agree with that? Yes, it seems that there was some that were settled together, and then there was a couple more that, um, over a period of time, were settled. Right. Uh, do you have any interaction with the, the plaintiffs, the, the victims of Mr Sanderlands during that process? No, we did not. Um, now, you say at paragraph 63 that the, that the approach taken by the church was that uh, the church and the college had failed in their duty of care to the victims? Yes. You see that? Yes. Was that ever communicated to the victims? During uh, the mediation, there was an opportunity to speak to the, to the victims and their parents. Uh, when that opportunity came our way, we... We said, yes, we'd like to do that. Um, we know that at that time there was a lot of anger, and so only, only a few came. None of the victims, but to the best of my recollection, parents came, and uh, we expressed our heartfelt sorrow for what had happened to them and their children. Now, at about this... Oh, sorry, I'll draw that. Um, was there ever a request made of you as um, the, the senior pastor at the church to provide a, um, a written apology to Mr Sanderland's victims? There came, there came one request by memory and yeah, there came one request and that was not of the five to the best of my recollection but was one of the other two that was several later. you offer to provide a, an apology to um, the victims of Mr Sandlands in, as part of the, the mediation process? Uh, sorry, was that a, a written apology? Well, of any sort? Well, during the mediation, we, we certainly did. We, we offered a, a verbal uh, apology to those in, in the first, uh, those two days that we talked about, the, the five victims. Right, OK, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Then uh, the issue about a, a written apology, did you offer a written apology um, to those five victims? No, we did not. Did you offer a written apology to any of the additional victims? Uh, th there was one, uh, which I'll bring up now, there was one that uh, actually specifically asked for a written apology. Can I comment on that one? Yes, did you provide yeah. that written apology? That, uh, that was our failing. Uh, and it's something I'm very open about. There was a, it, was a, it was a tumultuous time, um, but there was a request for a written apology, uh, also a tree to be planted, and also a copy of the child protection policies. Um, and were they provided? There's a, uh, I could give you excuses, but it's inexcusable. We should have done it, and I'm, we, we didn't respond the way we would today. And it's, that's, that's with regret. Do you recall the name of the, of the particular child concerned? Yes, Just I with did. reference to the certain illness there. Yes. Um, I think it's A-G-E. A-G-E. Thank you. Now, um, we have a copy of... Uh, actually, I should have raised it earlier, but we have a senior pastor's report 
from you, dated the de December the 19th, 2000. It's tab 54 of the tender bundle. If that could come up, please. <coughs> and if we could just go to the second page. You'll see there at the, the top paragraph then, there was consideration of Mr Sanderland's case. I can give you the full excerpt if you like, but it's really that last um, line I wanted to take you to. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry, please take your time and read through okay. that excerpt. So do I take it then that uh, you were concerned there from that last um, sentence, thank God, that the name of our college has been kept out of the media to date, that you were concerned about the reputation of the, the church and the college? Oh, certainly it was something that uh, we never envisaged that would happen to our church or college. Um, that was a part of the response, yes. And that the concern was that there would be adverse media concerning um, the church and the school? That would have been part of the... Yeah. All right. Now, if we then return to the mediation... Um, just have... Paragraph, sorry, tender bundle 67 brought up, please. Now, just before we go there, um, as a result of the mediations, you understand that a deed of settlement was entered into between the school um, and uh, the various plaintiffs? Yes, I'm aware of that. And... Not only did it indicate that a sum of money would be paid to each of the plaintiffs, you understand that? First yes, of all. yes. And also that they would agree to release the church from any further civil litigation. Did you understand that? I understand it now, yes. Yes. Well, were you involved in, in this part of the mediation? Uh, when it came to all of the uh, technicalities of um, these things being drawn up, it was left in the hands of, uh, of, of the lawyers, insurance lawyers, church lawyers. Um, but they were speaking. They were seeking instructions from you about how to the amount, for example, and the settlement. No, they, they were not. They basically um, they, they are the ones who led it, directed it. We were just um, there. Our part in the, in the whole of the mediation was to understand the, the severity of what had happened, and that became abundantly clear. But when it came to um, amounts, and um, that, 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 that was something that they settled with the, the other uh, plaintiff's lawyers. You understand that the effect of this deed, for example, is that it, um, that it mentions you as a defendant, that is to say, Northside Christian Centre as a, as a defendant. You understood that? Yes, I do. And that irrespective of the insurance claim that you've made, that this deed bound you as much as it did bind the plaintiff. Did you understand that? I understand it more now. Yes. I just wanted to take you to Clause 11. It's on the fourth page, or Ringtail 77. Just read that clause to yourself, please. Were you aware in November 2001 that this particular clause had been inserted into the, this deed of settlement? I can't say with any certitude that that was the case. Um, whether that was a standard clause, I'm not too sure, but we left that again in the hands of lawyers to, to deal with it. You say they didn't raise this issue of confidentiality specifically with you? Not specifically with me, no. 
Um, now we have a number of other examples of this, of these t terms of settlement. But do you accept that this particular clause, the confidentiality clause, applied for all of the victims of Sandlands? I think if it's, if it's in the contract, then I'll say yes. Can I ask you whether you intended, as a, as the senior pastor at the church, to stop the plaintiffs from speaking to the media about the abuse they had suffered? No, there's no way of doing that anyway. One way in which to do that is to require the plaintiff to sign a contract that says that they cannot do so. Do you, do you understand that? Yeah, I do now. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about this issue of confidentiality before today? No, I haven't given it a lot of thought. It was never our intention as a church to, to keep them quiet. Um, that's... That's, that wouldn't be coming from us as a, as a church. That, that's not who we are. Is it the policy of the church to um, have the victims of Mr Sandlands keep confidential the abuse that they've suffered? Not at all. Not at all. Now, you heard some evidence earlier on about conversations you had with... Pastor Spinella about the time of his resignation? Yes, I, I did. Um, and first of all, I want to take you to um, a board report that you provided. Um, in uh, November of 2001, if Tender Bundle 68 could come up, please. So this is a meeting where there was a consideration um, of, the, of the mediation of uh, six of the victims of Mr Sanderlands. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. And you were next to your report, a very um, a detailed consideration of the handling of the allegations against Mr Sanderlands right up into the mediation. Is that right? That's correct. And... To summarise reasonably quickly, uh, you were highly critical of Pastor uh, Dennis Smith and his handling of those allegations. It became apparent during the mediation um, and, and reading certain documents that um, there had been a neglect. Um, now, at that time, I didn't know who was involved in the investigation of the allegations, I'm becoming now more aware that it was not just one person, but there are various ones who were involved. But, but it became very clear that there had been um, uh, duty of care not being given um, and that the person actually making the decision at the end of the day was the senior pastor. And that was indisputable. Um, at page at ringtail four of that document, it's re referenced there to the hatred that parents and children had towards the college. Do you see that? Yes. And the barrister concerned was taken <laughs> aback by that. Yeah. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then there's a part entitled Anger Against Dennis Smith. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And that the parents and children blamed the past le leadership, in particular Dennis Smith as CEO, for allowing Ken Sanderlands to remain in the college despite numerous complaints and warnings. Yes. Um, and then the next page, if you go down the, the sixth paragraph there on that page... Um, there were issues of uh, integrity issues in Dennis's statement that don't sit right with me. Yeah. He's in effect calling Anne Brown, Tim Brown and multiple parents and students liars. I personally would not forget if a teacher was being accused by parents or children of indecent behaviour. Pastor Smith has an excellent memory. Do you see that? Yes. So do I take it from that you were concerned that uh, <laughs> Pastor Smith was not telling the whole truth? 
yes, that would be true. It was um, examination in particular, if, I, if my memory serves me correct, uh, it was the examination of his police statement um, that just did not sit right with me. Uh, there was a lot he didn't remember. And I, I do know that uh, Dennis Smith is very careful in, in writing down notes when he meets with people. And that's my experience working with him for many years. So that just didn't sit right with me. And if you go over the page there, you say at the top, we failed miserably in our duty of care. And uh, there are references. What are those references to? All right. And then, then the next thing you say, Dennis could have contacted the education department for advice, CCS, the police department. Do you see that? <coughs> so you were not aware that any of those steps have been taken by Pastor Smith? No, I was not aware. And it became apparent again uh, during the mediation that none of those steps were taken. And I saw, uh, I, I just couldn't understand why that didn't occur. So those, each of those organisations were available for advice <coughs> about matters concerning abuse of children. Correct. That was my understanding. And that's your understanding, having been at the school from 1987? Yes. All right. And then you reach the conclusion, I will be perfectly honest, this whole situation was completely bungled by the past leadership, and in particular by Dennis Smith, who had the power to fire Ken. You see that? Yes, I do. And um, that was your opinion when you wrote this memo, wasn't it? It is. And is it the same today? Unfortunately, yes. You spoke to, if we go over to page seven, you got some advice from the State President of the Assemblies of God. And he said it was obvious that uh, Dennis was negligent in his duty of care. Do you see that? Yes. And that he suggested to you that he fall on his sword for the church and college's sake. That's correct. And um, is that what then happened? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I, in consultation with him, as this report uh, clearly indicates, um, we both decided that it was the best course of action. It was the only course of action, really, because of what had happened. Right, I'll just go through it. So um, he gave his apologies for, for the meeting on um, the 7th of November. He said it was because you asked him not to attend that meeting. Is that right? That is correct, because, why, we're, because why, we're going to discuss these matters. I see. Uh, and as a result of this meeting, um, it was resolved that you would go to, um, you would communicate to him that he be given an opportunity to consider his present position in the light of this information. That's correct. And was the next step that you arranged the meeting at his house? Yes, and it was very shortly after that board meeting, I arranged a meeting with him. I said, I, want, I need to talk to you. Um, and you went round to his house? Yes, I did. Was it, was it just the two of you? It was, uh, it was just the two of us. I'm not sure whether his wife was in the room, but I don't think she stayed. It was basically, uh, I was talking to him. And what did you say to him? I, was, I gave him uh, some detail concerning the, the mediation, how it had gone, and then basically I said to him, it's very clear that there has been a failure of the church and duty of care, and that... And because you are the senior pastor and you were, you were leading the church during that whole time, that you are seen as the one who uh, did not do enough. What you did was inadequate. And there's a lot of anger. I said, uh, Dennis, there's a lot of anger towards you, um, especially from the parents of the children. So I just simply conveyed to him, um, and, and that I said we've discussed it as a board, it's very clear that there has been a neglect and you need to reconsider your position. I basically was, was saying to him, there is no other option. I conveyed what the board had decided. The board had decided that he needed to, he needed to go. I was just trying to find 
an appropriate way of saying it, but that's, that was basically it. Do you he understood very clearly what that conversation was about. He indicated to you that he understood clearly. Oh, he understood very clearly. Um, did, uh, do you agree with Pastor Smith's account that the reason he resigned was because he wanted to free up his salary for the payment of um, the settlement with Sanderland's victims? I, I don't agree with that. It may have come up as a point, but it was very clear he was being asked to step down. That was the main reason. Uh, now, in your statement, you've included some uh, detail about the nature of the current policies that the church has for the protection of children. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Um, and I won't go to those in detail, but perhaps uh, just to assure those uh, people, particularly those with children who are currently at the, at the school, um, if allegations in the nature of the ones that arose with Mr Sanderlands arose today, what are some of the steps that uh, the church and the school would take? We have uh, a policy of, um, of mandatory reporting that goes over and above even what, uh, what is suggested in guidelines. Uh, basically, if we receive a report, sexual abuse, uh, it is, our, say, one of our workers receives that report, they write down uh, write down the incident, they then have the obligation, uh, they must, because of moral duty, duty of care, to report that to uh, DHS, to the police department. They can receive assistance from their supervisor, uh, but that does not in any way negate their responsibility to report and that's done in every case where there's a sexual abuse allegation. You mentioned a moral duty. They also have a legal duty to do Correct. So. Correct. All right. Now, um, do I take it from your statement, particularly at paragraph 86, if that could come up, that the primary policy, for the church at least, is the Victorian... Uh, um, Australian Christian Church's child protection policy of 2005. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you'll need to say yes. Sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. I, I didn't know whether you'd finished. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, that is And correct. that's what's named the Kids Are Us policy. Yes. But in addition, the church also has something called the Encompass Kids Child Protection Policy Manual. Yes, that's true. Is that right? Yeah. And in... Either or both of those documents, it specifies the nature, the types of matters um, that would be considered suspicious yes. or of concern. Yes, it does. Um, and that would pick up um, a, the conduct such as the placing of children on the knee. Yes. And the frequent cuddling of children. Absolutely. And they're the kind of matters that would be reported through Absolutely. to DHS or... <laughs> Immediately. Yes. And what about for more serious allegations? So, for example, we've heard evidence of allegations of Sanderlands touching the genitals of, uh, of children. What steps would you take in those circumstances if they came to light? If they came to light, uh, the police would be contacted immediately. Um, the person would be removed... If it happened to be one of the, the workers immediately removed uh, from any contact with that child, the safety of the child is, is of the utmost importance. So the police will be called. Yeah. All right. Um, if the, the person involved was a pastor of, of the church, what's the process that would apply there? They would be stepped in. Is the senior pastor or one of the pastors? Well, let's start with the senior pastor. The senior pastor, uh, he, would be, uh, he would be stepped down. Uh, suspended, his his role would be suspended. It would then go to the board of directors. Uh, of course, it would go again to the, the police for investigation. Um, it would be reported immediately and an investigation would take place. He would not be uh, replaced at all until that all that investigation was <laughs> placed. Even then, um, there would be a very slow process in uh, putting him back into into that position. Well, are you aware of the process under the administration manual of, uh, of the ACC? Yes, I am. The, the grievance procedure? Uh, it, 
would be good if I could have it here, here. But yes, yes, I am. Yes, well, generally, generally speaking, you, you're aware that um, the process where there is an allegation against a, um, a senior pastor, particularly indeed any pastor with a credential that um, the church inform the state executive yes, of the I was, ACC? I was going to say that. I'm sorry, I missed a step. Yes, because he is a credentialed minister uh, with the ACC, the, um, the state executive would have to know, they would have to be informed, and they would become part of that investigation as well. But it does not negate uh, what is taking place with the police. And um, what are the steps taken within the church to advise those, particularly at the senior end of the church, about those policies and guidelines? Sorry, can you just repeat that last Yes. What, what steps are taken within the church mm. to train or to impart the information that's in both the church's policy and also in the ACC's policy about um, such matters? There's, um, whenever somebody um, applies to become a children's worker, uh, they have to fill in. Uh, they have to fill in forms, but but in particular, they have to read uh, the ACC um, policy, child policy. They have to sign off that they've read it. Uh, then there's a, a number of questions that uh, that are asked of them, and then there's a, a continual um, re-education, an annual, <coughs> annual re-education of that, sometimes biannual. It's something that needs to be instilled on a constant basis. The, the, um, our mandatory reporting requirements and um, different sections of the, of the ACC child protection policy. And uh, you indicate that there's been or there is currently a, an internal review of the policies and procedures? That's correct. From paragraph 92 of your statement? Yes. And one of the identified areas for improvement um, is the, making it as easy as possible for children to raise any concerns. Do you see that? Yes. What's the concern there that's been raised? Well, I, I think it was, it's not that there's not an open channel of communication. There's a, there's a culture of openness. It's, it's, com, it's completely, that, that, that they can contact any, any teacher at any point in time or any worker. Just wanted to make it even, uh, even easier for them maybe just to raise the alarm and, and we're looking, seeking for advice. Sometimes a child may not feel uh, they have the capacity to verbalise. And Just looking at every possible means of them alerting us there's a problem here and looking at it, external uh, advice in that area because we realise we're not the experts in it. We're looking at current policies. Uh, we, want, we want to external help in that. All right, and uh, have you been looking to the ACC for that sort of assistance or uh, to other bodies? Uh, we're looking to other bodies. Uh, Childhood Foundation is one we're looking at right now, and uh, it's, yeah, we've become part of that process. All right, and, uh, and in your dealings with the ACC, particularly the Victorian level, have they been of assistance to you in, in, um, in the development of policies and the handling of complaints? The, the Oh, so there's two questions. The, the development of uh, the, the ACC policy, I think it's a uh, child protection policy, is a robust one. Uh, we're looking to the ACC in, more in regards to implementation of that policy, because it's one thing to have a policy, it's another thing to implement it and have practices. And so the ACC as a whole, um, because of some of the large churches, it gives us some, uh, some insight into how to apply that those policies say into youth ministry, into children's ministry. So yes, they are a, a good resource. Mm. Those are my questions. Thanks, Mr. Beckett. Ms. McGlinchey. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Pastor Spinella, my name is Ms. McGlinchey and I represent Emma Fretton in these proceedings. Uh, just um, two matters. Uh, uh, the mediation, you participated in the mediation on behalf of the church. Yes. Uh, you were here when uh, uh, Emma Fretton gave, gave evidence about her uh, reaction to seeing a, a, a group of people <coughs> on the other side praying together. Yes. Um, do you recall? Did, do you recall that event, a prayer meeting at the beginning of the the mediation, or a prayer group? I don't. I don't recall that being a prayer group. We may have said it just a quick word of prayer, but certainly was not something um, that stands out in my mind. I couldn't give you a location. I couldn't give you an extent of time. It may have been just, just 
just a simple prayer. I, that's all I remember, and I, I, I don't want to doubt in any way what Emma is saying. That's just all what I remember. Oh, so you don't remember a, a group when you all sort of stood together and said a prayer at the beginning of that? No. There was only three of us at that time. There was myself, there was my wife, and there was another board member. There was only three that actually came um, together from memory. Right. And then there were others who came and went, but usually there was only three of us uh, at the beginning in the of the At the beginning of the mediation. Correct. Yeah, right. Even throughout it. Yeah. All right. Um, you've um, given some evidence to council assisting about that your the level of what you understood to have happened increased greatly as a result of the mediation. Right. And you understood after the mediation the level of anger uh, towards the church uh, and uh, generally over what had happened. Yes, so, yes, that's true. All right. And you've reported to the board uh, about, about all of that. And I take it that there was the board would have been quite shocked as well about... Very shocked. Right. Very angered, saddened, right. in you, disbelief. Sorry. Okay. Mm. Did you feel that it was would be worthwhile to let the rest of your church community know what you now knew um, in terms of what had happened and how you had let down the, the students over a number of years? Yes. Uh, what actually happened is that after the mediation, because it all happened... We didn't know what this, what the mediation, how the mediation was going to play out. After the mediation, we called a special members meeting, and uh, we have members who are attached to the church. Some just attend on a fairly irregular basis, but the, the true membership came together, and I explained to them what had happened and how there'd been uh, a failure uh, by past leadership in regards to uh, a number of children. Uh, they were shocked, so they knew at that point in time, and it's all recorded in, in minutes that uh, that meeting. Do you have any kind of newsletter that goes out to your broader community, or um, did you feel it was important to keep the broader community uh, aware of what was happening and the lessons that had been learnt? From um, as far as the church was concerned, we, we knew if we told that the membership that that would just spread very, very quickly in regards to that. Um, this, that, would, that was the only means of communication, actually, that we have uh, in regards to the church community. We you know that the, uh, the college had its own way of communicating as well. Do you know whether the college communicated with the, uh, with the, the, the parents uh, at the time of the mediation? I can't recall exactly what was what was done, but I'm, I know that there, many of them knew. Uh, it was it was quite a common uh, piece of information. It was it was out there, yes. But I, I couldn't specifically tell you whether there was a it was put into a newsletter. I, I don't know because they their means of communication is a newsletter uh, with the. Yeah. Thank you. Nothing further. Okay. Mr. Pratt. Thank you. Pastor Spinelli, my name is uh, Pratt. I represent Reverend Smith in this matter. Can I take you to uh, document? Well, firstly, can I ask you, firstly, in 1993, at the end of 1993, were you absent from the college? Sorry, could you ask that question again? In, at the end of 1993 and the beginning of 1994, were you absent from the college? From the college? From the church. Oh, from the church. My apologies. No, no, I, I was in the church. You were there. Uh, from your statement, it seems that you have no recall or poor recall of events occurring at that time there, namely the conversation that Mr Vaughan says he has with you and the minutes of the uh, December, January 93-94 board meeting. At that time there, had you been there, then if those were correct, you clearly would have been advised at that time there of the issues regarding Mr Sandlins. Is I that object. right? 
So I, I don't know I, what the question I think is. It's, sorry, it's a, um, it's a very long, con it's a it very long uh, question, and I'm as guilty as the next person of asking those sorts of convoluted questions, but I think it needs to be I'll try again. specified. My question is this, that you say that you were present at the church at the end of 1993, correct? correct? But that you say that you have no recall of speaking to Mr Vaughan regarding allegations he raised? Object, I don't understand that this witness has given that evidence. I think it needs to be put in a slightly different way if um, my learned friend's well, going in the statement. direction that I think he is. Well, it's, well, happy to take your statement. At paragraph 50 of your statement, you talk about... Um, sorry. Paragraph 48 of your statement um, relates to Jim Vaughan report to me. Yes. You say in paragraph 50 you don't recall having any such conversation with Mr Vaughan. I made it very clear in my witness statement that I, there is no doubt that Jim Vaughan did not speak to me about sexual allegations. So Mr Vaughan is mistaken? Mr Vaughan. He may have thought so, but he did not. Again, just for the record, this... Um uh, I object to this question on the basis that this reference is taken from a chronological summary, as it's entitled, that was put together by Mr Rooks. So there is, in fact, um, another stage in the process. So this is Mr Rooks's record of something perhaps that Mr Vaughan may have said, but we yes. just don't know. And you have no recollection of the minutes of the December 93, January 94 board meeting. I've already stated that. In document 68 of the uh, tender bundle, if we can have that brought up, please. Uh, bring tail six here. The, the second paragraph, sorry, the third paragraph of that page there, well, it starts at, I'll be perfectly honest. Well, the last sentence is, because I know this was not intentional. Could you explain what you meant by that? It's hard for me to go back that far. It was my view that... At that time, when I wrote this, that it was not something that he had schemed, that it was an intentional cover-up. That it was not an intentional cover-up? I didn't think so. That's not... I'm, I, this is only my opinion. But uh, the whole thing was handled... I said the word bungled. And the reason I said that is not enough was done. Investigations did take place but there were not enough, and they failed. They failed in their responsibilities. But was it intentional? At that time, I'm saying I didn't think it was an intentional cover-up. The, you, make the, you make reference to the investigations there. Um, you were asked before about Pastor Smith deferring to Mr Rooks. And you accept that he would do in day-to-day -day matters, correct? Uh, they would meet together on a regular basis. That was my understanding. The investigations you speak about that you are now aware of are ones involving Pastor Ingram, uh, Ms. Ms Lovell. Is that the... You understand that Pastor Smith was obviously requesting those investigations occur? Correct. Now I know that. And is that where your view that his the bungling was not an intentional act on their behalf? No, at that time, at that time I didn't know that. I, I didn't. It's only as I began to read all of the information 
uh, in preparation for this Royal Commission that I began to understand who was involved in the investigation, that there were others that were involved. So that statement there didn't, does not relate to what you're talking about. So at, at that time, you only were aware of Pastor Smith, Mr Rooks and Mr Ellery, is that right? At that time, in 2000, I would have been aware of Mr Rooks. Yes, Dennis Smith. They're the two I would have been sure about. If we scroll down on this document, please, the next page. Paragraph there in the middle of the page down says, as I spoke to him about the gravity of the situation, it took your notes there so indicate that he was giving serious consideration to tendering his resignation. Yes. Was that prior to or after your meeting with him at his home? in which you essentially said he needed to resolve. The reference to this is that he knew that the mediation was taking place. He knew that instinctively that, that he was the head of the organisation during that time. Him speaking to me saying he was giving serious consideration in tendering his resignation was in view of the fact there was he must have realised that there was some culpability on his side. So it, it, had, it had everything to do with uh, the mediation and uh, the claims against the church. It had nothing to do with... My understanding of this, in, in my writing, it had to do everything about what was going on in that the church was being sued. He thought, so he was giving consideration. Even before I approached him, he was giving giving some consideration to that. Right, so prior to you approaching him, he has indicated to you that he was considering tendering his resignation. For the reason, but now that I look at this, for Sorry. the reason, for the reason... The question uh, is quite simple. Yeah. Well, I think, okay. I think he can finish his answer yes. to that. Oh. Do, do finish your answer. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't... Yeah. Um, he was giving uh, consideration, now reading this, says, as I spoke to him about the gravity of the situation, he told me he was giving serious consideration in tendering his resignation. It was, it had everything to do with the fact that, um, of, of what was actually happening, the claims against the church. So in that two month period, when it was all happening, he was thinking about his future. And when I spoke to him, uh, it seemed that he already was coming to a, decision about his future. It just then confirmed. My discussion confirmed what he was already thinking. You worked with Pastor Smith for a long time? I did. And you say in your statement that you were, your notes said you'd been very loyal to him. Yes. Did you have a, a regard for Pastor Smith? Yes. And you held him in some level of esteem? Yes, I did. You believed him to be a, uh, an honourable man? Yes. A person who would act in the best interest of the church and its community? Yes. Has, is Pastor Smith uh, still fondly recalled at uh, Northside Christian College? Or Northside Christian Centre, sorry? Objection. 
such a vague question. Mm. I think, I'm not sure that I would assist the Royal Commission in its deliberations. Has there been any reason in the, since his departure for Pastor Smith to be invited back to Northside Christian Centre? Yes. What was the uh, circumstances of that? There was a 60th anniversary of the, the church and we invited all the senior pastors who were in any way in leadership over the past, those who were alive, and we invited them to come. There are some, obviously, who are deceased. And uh, you met with him at that occasion? Yes, I invited him. Yes, of course. And was there a degree of uh, anger or expressed towards him at that, at that, on that occasion? Um, no. Huh? That's only my personal opinion. I'm, I'm only asking you. Yes. Thank you. I've got nothing further. Sorry about questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner, just a, some questions for Pastor Spinella. My name is uh, Mr Woods. As you know, Pastor Spinella and I appear with Mr Bird on behalf of Northside Christian College and Northside Christian Church. Um, just firstly, by way of clarification, I think... Um, everyone's in fierce agreement on the transcript that your um, statement is dated the um, 17th of September and I just, for a matter of correction of the record, I, I believe it is dated the 15th of September. Can you look at page 18 of 18 and oh, sorry. just confirm that for me? It might be my reading of the It's 15th. 15th, thank you. Um, all right, and... Um, in relation to uh, the civil proceedings, it's correct that uh, there were seven survivors of abuse who took civil uh, proceedings against uh, the church and other entities, is that correct? That's correct. Yes, and um, is it correct that in those <laughs> proceedings, each of those uh, seven people were legally represented throughout? Yes, they were. And um, in relation to the terms of settlement, if TB67 could be brought up on the screen, please, and just the final paragraph 11 of that document. Um, Council assisting asked you some questions about the terms of settlement and how they came to be negotiated, um, and in particular, we were asked some questions about confidentiality. Um, now, Pastor Spinella, I'm not asking you for legal advice, but um, is it correct that Clause 11 is, in fact, uh, stating that the terms themselves shall be kept strictly confidential, but they do not restrict the right of a victim to talk about their abuse. That's correct. Thank you. And um, in relation to... Um, um, you were asked... Um, some questions about a 19th of December 2000 senior pastor's report in which you um, identified uh, concerns as to um, media and you, as I understood it, you said that was one of the concerns that you had. I'd like to take you to that 7th of November 2001. This is TB, uh, sorry, um, it's the uh, tab 68 of the tender bundle and at page 5 of that document. Now, um, you gave evidence the media was one of your concerns. Can I take you to uh, the paragraph where... Okay, perhaps if you could scroll down a bit. Uh, keep going. So it's that final uh, paragraph there where you talk about the disregard of children's concerns over a period of up to 10 years as being inexcusable. Was that another one of your concerns? That was very much, very much our, my concern. And you also used the phrase, uh, precious little girls as being abused. Was the um, well-being of those precious little girls another of your concerns? Absolutely. And... Just in relation to sorry, just have a 
moment. Um, I just want to ask you a brief question about current policies, and you've, you've addressed this in some detail. Is it correct that both the church and the school are firstly separate uh, legal entities? Yes, they are now. And is it correct that both of them, both of those entities, have their own policies and procedures on a number of issues? Yes, that's And specifically correct. in relation to protection of children, they have separate policies? That's correct. And in relation to the school's policies, and specifically here, I'm talking about um, policies relating to the protection of children. Uh, to your knowledge, has the Victorian Registra Registration and Qualification <laughs> Authority carried out um, a review of those policies um, within the last year or so? Yes, uh, back in June. Yes, and that's the Victorian Statutory Authority that ch that's charged with um, ensuring that education providers meet particular quality standards? Mm, that's right. And was the result uh, of that review that the current policies and procedures of the school uh, have passed that review with the VRQA? Yes, they meet all legislative requirements. <laughs> and um, lastly, I wanted to ask you, um, it was uh, abundantly clear, certainly to me, during Ms Fretton's evidence, that it was very important to her that not only um, should there be an apology, and I understand your evidence that you offered apologies at the mediation, but only one group of parents took you up on that. Yeah. At paragraph 7, if that could be brought up of your witness statement, now, is it correct that you say there that at the time of preparing the statement you hadn't seen any of the witness statements that any survivors of the abuse would be pro providing to the Royal Commission, is that right? That is correct. And that you wanted the opportunity to, to specifically respond to the no doubt painful contents of such witness statements and you wanted the opportunity to do so, is that correct? Yes. Um, now, Ms Fretton said it was particularly uh, important to her, uh, quite understandably if I might say so, that there was an acknowledgement and not just an apology. Um, how would you like to respond to those words of Ms Fretton? Yeah. What happened at the college was <laughs> something which is uh, enduring regret. And to to Emma, to to many of the other students, I apologise. I apologise on behalf of. Our church, the failures of uh, Northside Christian College, I just say sorry. And, and uh, it should never have happened. It should never have been allowed to continue. And I apologise to. Uh, to the victims, and we will do everything in our power, both in the college, in the church, to ensure as much as possible that this will never happen again. It should never happen to little, to little children. They are precious. Thank you, Pastor Spinell. No further questions. Mr. Nothing arises. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Pastor Spinella. Thank you for your attendance. You're otherwise excused. Your Honour, um, uh, there is one more witness who is listed for today, Pastor Shane Baxter. Um, I understand that a number of counsel and uh, other legal practitioners are here at the moment um, just for that particular witness. That would otherwise um, go home um, if uh, if Pastor Baxter's evidence was completed today. Um, I wonder if I could beg the indulgence of the Royal Commission to sit on to hear his evidence. I expect to be about 15, 20 minutes with him. Yeah. It doesn't cause any difficulty to Commissioner Atkinson and myself. 
no problems with me. None here. No, no right. I think that it would assist because the, the, the bar table will completely change over for right. uh, the next part of the hearing, if that was the case. Let's do that. I call Pastor Shane Baxter. Pastor Baxter, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath, please. All right. If you raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this Royal Commission. In this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Pastor. If you replace the Bible and take a seat, please. Thank you. Pastor Baxter, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. Uh, my name is Shane Elwyn Baxter. And um, you've given your uh, address to the Royal Commission. I have. And um, your current occupation is a Minister of Religion. It is. And you occupy the position of uh, State President of the ACC in Victoria. I do. Um, and you provided a statement dated the 30th of September 2014 to the Royal Commission. I did. And are there any changes to that that you wish to make? Uh, there's a couple, if I may, uh, just slight ones. So in the second paragraph, yes, I think it says that, uh, that um, I've been at Enjoy Church since 1988. That should be 1998. Um, also in paragraph three there, it says there are over 350 churches. There's actually 253. That's wishful thinking. And so, and then in paragraph 20, if we can go down there, I probably just want to make uh, uh, certain you understand something. It may not be clear if you don't. So if we could go to paragraph 20, please, where it says there, uh, the investigator will then provide, in the middle there's a sentence that says, the investigator will then provide the credentialed minister with a copy of the complaint and the details of any other statement that has been obtained during investigations. Um, that is that is the desire, but if there is a police investigation going on at that time, we would not do that. We have to notify them that there has been a complaint, um, but we may or may not work in conjunction with the police, give them that information. All right. Um, and uh, is there anything else that you wish to change in your no, statement? That's it. I, is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? It is. Okay. I tender the statement. 18 point. Zero zero two four. Now, sir, I understand that um, the primary child protection policy that has been adopted um, by the Victorian branch of the ACC is the Kids Are Us Victoria Child Protection Policy of 2005. That's right. Is that right? That's right. And um, we've heard some evidence in the Hillsong part of this case study about a similar policy being adopted <laughs> in New South Wales. Yeah. You're aware of that? I am. And um, is it the case that the ACC in the various states and territories around Australia have adopted similar, it is. Uh, similar policies on child protection? It is. And they occurred at about the same time? I would you? think so. Yes. Yeah. And now... You've annexed to your statement um, a document. It's marked SB-1. If that could come up, please. And you'll notice there that um, the Kids R Us Victoria Child Protection Policy um, was considered at the state executive meeting on, I presume that's, well, I'm not sure what that is, but in, in April of 2005. That's right. Number um, 226, is that a reference to 26th of April? Sorry. It says 226 April 2005. That's just the number of the meeting, is it? That's right. That's what that would be. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and it says there that uh, with minor additions from... 
these sources, namely the Department of Human Services and the State Solicitor, we will be presenting the policy as a remit to the State Conference for consideration at our September incorporation meeting. See that? I do. And uh, so the document was adopted at uh, the State Conference, was it? That's right. All right. Now, the position of this policy and the way in which the ACC works is that notwithstanding the fact that it's been adopted at state level, yeah. um, it cannot be enforced or you do not require your members to adopt that policy. Is that the, the right way in which to interpret the process? Okay. At 2005, when we presented it to the, uh, to the conference in Victoria, we strongly recommended that each local church, because they are their own incorporated body, would adopt uh, this policy within their own churches. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no churches uh, in Victoria that have not adopted either this policy or one very similar. All right. How do you know that? Uh, uh, we know that because um, we have a state executive, we have regional teams, and so basically we, we work with local pastors, local churches, and as I say, the best of our knowledge, so we will ask pastors. Um, and um, as a movement, I would say the vast majority of us, vast, vast majority of us, I don't know anyone that doesn't want to protect children. And so this is not an issue which is on the back burner with the ACC, it hasn't been for years. In fact, when in 2005, uh, when, we, when we actually implemented this policy, made mandatory uh, reporting part of what we do, it wasn't, legis uh, wasn't legislation back then, but we wanted it to be. Uh, so the churches that are with us, uh, we believe, um, on the whole, are wanting to embrace the policies that we're recommending because they want to protect their children. At the end of the day, that's what it's really all about, providing a safe place where children can be uh, cared for and grow up in a very healthy, safe environment. Have you received since 2005 any indication from any church within Victoria affiliated to the ACC that they have not implemented this particular policy? No, I'm not aware of any. Well, I'm not aware of one. Are you aware... Have you come... Sorry, I'll draw that. Are you aware of any circumstances where the policy has been adopted but not followed within uh, an affiliated church in Victoria. Okay, so uh, am I aware of any? No. Yes. Do I think it could be possible? Possibly. As it, yeah. But right. am I aware of any? No. All right. So in terms of the way that the regional offices and those that are dealing with affiliated churches yep. operate, how do they ensure, first of all, um, that the policy has been adopted? How do they do that? Okay, that, is, that would be... Um, there are, there's a number of training days that we have throughout a year. We, we train boards. Um, one, one of the areas that we train boards in is areas of risk. And so we, we particularly look at areas of risk to church. And this is a huge area of risk, obviously, to children. But as, from a board point of view, it's obviously then an area of risk to the church. So we, and those training days assist with implementation of the policy, including the 2005 yeah. policy. Is that That's right? right. The 2005 policy, uh, we will certainly direct them to them as the policy that we would put before them. But as uh, we heard last week, I think it was, with Hillsong, uh, they might take that policy, take it to their solicitors, take it to other er uh, experts in this field and get their input in on, on it as well. All right. I want to take you to some parts briefly of the... Um, of the 2005 policy, and um, if I can do that briefly, um, uh, tender bundle 42. So this is the, the Kids R Us 2005 policy, is that right? That's it. And then um, it seems to have three parts, part A, B and C. Yep. Is that right? I think so. And if we go to ringtail 659, we'll see part A for every church helper and worker. And there's a policy that governs the conduct of, of those in those various location camps, children's ministry, house meetings and so forth. Yep, Is that policy. right? That's right. So conduct policy, it governs the, how you are to conduct yourself in those 
That's right. circumstances. Is that right? That's right. And then um, if you go over to the next page, Ringtail 660, we'll see uh, Part B, which is for the children's leader slash worker. Yep. And that governs, I presume, um, passes all the way down to youth workers who are operating, working with children. Is that right? Uh, yeah. In, in the case of the ACC, a youth worker would usually be working for, with uh, grade six up. Where so, uh, in relation to this policy, we're we're looking uh, at children anywhere really from six months all the way through to the end of that youth time. So, right. but so in terms of the uh, the people that it covers within the uh, within the church, yep. is it right to say that it covers pastors? Absolutely. Um, does it cover members of the church? Uh, members of the church that are working within the context of that ministry, that's right. They're working the ministry. Um, does it also include volunteers? It does. Um, it includes, I presume, employees of um, each relevant church. That's right. All right. Um, and we see there, if you go down to B3.4, there are reporting and notification procedures noted there. Yeah. And it's divided between where the alleged abuser is not in ministry and where the alleged abuser is in ministry. Do you see that? I see that. And just to finish the, the structure of this policy, if we go over to 662, we see the contents of Part C, which is for the children's pastor and church pastors and elders. Yes. Do you see that? I see that. And... Some general comments are made about mandatory reporting in the common law there. I see that. And um, then the policy governs screening, induction and training, and so forth at C5 and C6. Is that right? That's right. So do I take it that the principal policy with respect to reporting and notification procedures is that in Part B? If we can go back, we could go back to six six zero. When it comes to reporting, yes, you see, that issue. That's man right. mandatory right. reporting and then reporting and notification procedures. Do you see that? Uh, do you see that? All right. Now, if we just go through to page twenty seven and pick up where three point four falls. It's ringtail six nine zero. So with the, the first paragraph there, it says that the child is the primary concern and all other concerns must be secondary. Do you see that? I do see that. And then if we go down further, that um, it's a requirement of the church that where a pastor, staff member, worker or volunteer becomes aware of or suspects an incidence of child abuse, that the following actions take place. And uh, then there are three dot points. Um, the first is, must be reported to Child Protection Services as soon as possible. Do you see that? I see that. Now, for those who are not Victorian-based, the Child Protection Services is what sort of service? Uh, child Protection Services is part of DHS. So we would go to DHS and uh, or straight to Child Protection Services. Depending on what the issue is, we would also go straight to the police. All right. It doesn't seem to say, refer to going straight to the police. No, it That's doesn't, but I'm saying we would, as in that is that would be the bottom line. This is where it starts. All right. Um, then it's reported up to uh, the senior pastor or department head. Yep, That's right. And then where there are credentials involved, and we've had um, some evidence last week about... Um, the use of the administration manual. It's also reported to the state headquarters of, well, it says Assemblies of God, but it's now the ACC, is that right? That's right. All right. Then there's a diagram at the next page which sets out the, the process. Yep. Now, um, if we just follow that through, this seem, seems to cover the first part of the process in the sense that you have the disclosure in that top box. Yep. Then it goes to Child <laughs> Protection Services on the left-hand side, 
but also on the right hand side it goes to the senior pastor or department head do you see that yes and then it's notified to the senior pastor if they've not been notified um, and to the eldership board as soon as possible yes and then the senior pastor may also contact child protection services for advice yes and appropriate pastoral care is offered do you see that i do so We'll come to some more detail in a moment, but that seems to be the start of the process, just the, the sort of the immediate <laughs> notification of the disclosure of abuse. Is that right? That would be right. All right. And if we go over the page to 3.4.2, and the second paragraph particularly, you say, although it says, although any accused person is essentially innocent until proven guilty, it is a requirement of the church that the worker or volunteer be stood down as soon as possible. Do you see that? Oh, so it's a process of suspension of the relevant worker. Yes. And again, if the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator is a pastor, then you advise the state executive of that matter. Yes. And then that's... If we then go over to 693, we'll see another flow diagram. Um, 693, yes, thank you. So at the, at the top we have the implication in abuse, <laughs> which follows from the disclosure, is that right? That's right. And then the worker's superior is informed as soon as possible. Um, and... Again, allegations to the CPS on the left-hand side, eldership board and senior pastor on the right-hand side. Yes. That seems to be a repetition, really, of the last flow diagram. Does that sound Pretty right? Much so. yeah. Then we have that box in the middle. The workers informed of the allegations and stood down. <coughs> do you see that? I do see that. And then these are the parts that I wanted to ask you about. If we could just scroll down a bit further, please. You see in the centre there... Senior Pastor Eldership Board seeks professional advice and liaises as required with the Child Protection Services. Do you see that? I see that. Is informed the insurance department is advised if there are any concerns about that or any claim that... Um, yeah. Sorry, I would withdraw that. Any notification that should be made of the insurer about the allegations? It's just a notifying. Yes. And then... To the right, the senior pastor and the state executive are also advised. Yep, that's right. And then appropriate pastoral care is offered to all concerned under the direction of the eldership board. Yes. So if I can pick it up there, you've gone through that process of taking these serious allegations through to the CPS. You provided them all the way up to the board level. What's the, what's the step that's taken with, with the alleged victim? Or the, particularly the child concerned at that stage. What? What is the? What, sorry. Yes. What's the policy? What's the policy that's set out here? It refers to appropriate parcel care is offered. What's that a reference to? Okay. So what we would do is, um, and it depends, because obviously you've asked me uh, questions in regards to if we go to the top, there's a, there's a range of different people there. So every scenario is going to be different. So, uh, if it's a senior pastor, if it's a pastor, an associate pastor, children's pastor, leader, worker, there is a scale here. Yes. So, when it comes to the individual who is now uh, become a victim in this situation, we want to give them proper and adequate pastoral care. Uh, we want to give uh, their family the proper and adequate pastoral care. Uh, we would, uh, as a local church, uh, provide either a counsellor or a psychologist and then when the investigation begins and it would depend on who's going to do that investigation whether it be the police whether it be department of human services whether it be the church we're going to work with all the different agencies to make sure um, at the end of the day that child is protected to the best of our ability all right so I, you imagine also i won't put it this way but um Certainly a, a number of your members, you're over 200 members, some are small, some are large, that's right. Of, of the congregations you're talking about? Church yes. congregations. Right. Church congregations. That's right. Yes. Some of them, are, you know, they might have one senior pastor and a couple of staff members, but apart from that, they're quite small. 
Uh, no, correct. Uh, within the ACC in Victoria, yes. Um, our churches in general range from uh, thirty to ten thousand. Yes, in terms of congregation. Yeah. But in terms. Um, the, the people who work there, that is in terms of okay. the senior pastor and uh, yep. so associated you, staff. Yeah, so you may have um, literally nobody on staff yes. all the way through to 50 staff. All right, so some of those churches are, are going to have trouble, aren't they, providing... Um, um, sorry, I'll withdraw that. Some of those, some of those churches, particularly the small ones, yep. won't have immediate access to counselling services That's right. and so forth. And so what who, is, who do they turn to? For yeah, what advice? would normally happen is um, if there was an instance like this, they would make contact with the State Office of the ACC um, and then as a movement we'll walk alongside the pastor or the leadership and we will do whatever we need to do to bridge that gap because we are aware that some don't have the financial resource behind them to do what would be seen to be adequate, in which case that's where we as a movement step in to provide whatever care. And, and we, uh, we do provide um, um, psychologists, we do provide whatever is required at large to take care of our own. Do you... Uh, have you had... Um particular experience of how this policy works, where there are such allegations? Um, not in regards to... Not in regards to people that are holding current positions within a church. If you're asking me, have I ever been informed about a person within our congregation yes. Yes. who has done the wrong thing by a child? Absolutely. Yes. And what was the, um, the connection... Sorry. What advice or what assistance did the ACC provide that particular church in dealing with um, the allegations against that person? Okay. Okay. So in regards to my previous answer, it was in regards to Enjoy Church, which is our church, and we, we took care of our, our people. All right. So, But that's in relation to your personal church where you were, the, you were right. or are the senior pastor. Is that's that right? right. Which is how I took All the right. question. What was the assistance provided by the ACC yeah. to your church um, in that process? Yeah, we didn't need assistance because we're large enough to be able to take care of our own people. All right, and as far as you knew, was the victim and the victim's family happy with that approach? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, that's it. So, yeah, bottom line, absolutely. They're still in our church. Yeah. All right. Um, and just going to the bottom of that page, you'll see... At the bottom it says, if the worker is found guilty, the appropriate authority will terminate ministry on the recommendation of the eldership board. So that obviously depends on a number of factors. If the, if the issue is about, if the allegation is against a, a pastor with credentials, then yeah. the ACC at either the state or the national level would deal with that matter? Absolutely. And they would dismiss the person? Uh, no, because the dismissal... Sorry, I, I, I withdraw that. They would um, withdraw the credential of that. <coughs> That's pastor. right. And as soon as we become aware that there is an accusation against a credential holder, um, as a state president, I will make contact with our national president. I will ask that, we, um, that I have the authority to suspend his credential, um, and which I've never been told no, not that it's happened in regards to a child, but... Um, and then once it goes through, especially if there are legal proceedings and that person is found guilty, uh, if they are found guilty in regards to interfering with a child, uh, they will never and should never have a credential again with the ACC or any other church for that matter. All right. Now, if the um, if the the alleged perpetrator is not a not a minister, then. It, it falls for the church concerned to take any appropriate action if the person has been found guilty, so, for example, by dismissing the person from employment. Employment? Yes, if they're employed within a church and found to have sexually abused a child, been convicted. Yeah. No, that local church would dismiss them, I'm certain. All right. And if, yeah. And what about in terms of membership of a church where it's gone through to that particular stage? Yeah, so we would, we would recommend, as it would be at my own church, that if someone was to interfere or abuse a child, then they 
forego the right or opportunity to fellowship with us. And so if they had been in our church, they won't be anymore. All right. Now, that's um, a policy that your church, Enjoy Church, has. Is yeah, that right? That's right. And is that replicated across the other churches in the Victorian uh, section of the ACC? No, I would say when it comes to volunteers and local congregational issues, matters, um, it goes back to uh, the senior pastor and the board of that local church. Um, usually the senior pastor is the chairman of the board, that's why I refer to him as well as the board. Um, uh, and But it would certainly be the view of, I think, the majority of us that um, if you know that someone has abused children, that you would not be welcoming them into fellowship and keep them in your church. All right. Is there... Um, I note from uh, paragraphs 44 and 50 of your statement that you um, recommend, I think, to your members that they apply the, the discipline pr provisions of their constitutions. Is that right? Yeah, and if we can turn there, because I think it's in context. If I'm okay, well, let's look at 44. How a church member is disciplined is a decision to be made by the local affiliated church. That's right. So what You offer right. advice and assistance in dealing with those member issues, <coughs> is that right? Yeah, we do. And, and in regards to discipline, uh, that is in regards to what, whatever it is. If it is in regards to a issue of sexual abuse, that is one thing. Um, when I put this statement together, we were talking about any number of issues that we have to actually bring discipline to an individual within a local church. So we refer them back to their own constitution because as an incorporation they will have their own cons constitution and it will talk there about um, um, their own members and behaviours, practices, uh, that would require them to be disciplined. Um, the reason I'm taking you to this particular part is that it, it appears that um, you're recommending that the, the, the discipline process that they have in operation in their particular church governs, governs whether a member, for example, is to continue as a, as a member of the church. That would be right. Yes. Do you, think, do you see any merit in the state... Um, chapter of the ACC in developing some form of discipline policy for churches to apply in cases of child sexual abuse? Um, yeah, I do see merit in it. There's no doubt about that. Yes. And the reason I ask you that is because it seems that your recommendation is use the general policy that applies yeah. in your church. Yeah. Whereas you'd agree that we're dealing with certainly a very serious matter in child sexual abuse, Absolutely. but also there's a um, an inequality, if you like, between some churches who are well resourced, can seek legal advice and yeah. deal with it in detail, and other churches who don't have those resources and have few staff on hand to be able to do with those matters. Yeah. Yep. So I can see merit in what you're saying. I would also say that if the smaller churches are looking for advice, we have two staff members um, that are at their disposal 24-7 that are there to give advice, give counsel, give wisdom uh, in regards to these matters. All right. And they would assist with the process of considering oh, absolutely. those discipline issues. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Have you seen that occur in practice? Uh, not in regards to a, a, a child um, accusation of abuse, uh, but in many other issues. In fact, these guys run 24-7. Right, such as what sort of um, allegations are you talking about? Or allegations of, um, if it be members that are just abusive, whether it be members that are divisive, whether it be members that are stealing communion juice, whether it be members that are... It just goes on there. It's, uh, there are a number of discipline issues that come up from time to time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. we're just trying to help people. And just uh, to finish up with paragraph 50, if we can scroll down to that. 
you say complaints in relation to the conduct of members or volunteers of local churches are dealt with by the local church. I presume your answer is the same with respect to that matter. In other words, it's governed by local discipline policy. Yeah, it would be, but we're, we're happy to give advice, happy to come alongside, walking through processes, turn up the board meetings, whatever we need to do. All right, yes. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr Beckett. Mr Pratt. No, thank you. Mr Chow. Can I go last or not? Yes. Nothing. My turn then. Uh, Mr Baxter, my name is Craig Chowdhury, I act for Australian Christian Churches. Uh, is there some term of art with members of a church? Is it what? Sorry? Is it a term of art? That is, is there a difference between a member of a church within the movement as opposed to an ordinary church goer? Uh, that depends which church you go to. Right. So, um, because of our constitutions being slightly different, yes. uh, sometimes a member might be considered as part of the board. Sometimes a member is the legally uh, is the legal member of the incorporation, and other times a member is someone who is committed to be there week in week out, who is a part of that church. All right. Uh, whatever term is used, uh, a person who had been convicted of child sex abuse would not be permitted to attend a church in your jurisdiction. Is that correct? Um, I, I do not have jurisdiction over those other churches, but I would strongly recommend that um, no person who has been convicted of child sex abuse be welcome into a Sunday worship environment. And the reason that is is because there's just too many opportunities for evil people to turn up and do the wrong thing. So in regards to um, a scenario, if someone was to turn up, and they wanted to get their life right with God. As it is in our case, we have a men's group that meets every two weeks on a Wednesday night. If he wants to have fellowship and engage with 40-something-year-old men, well, he can do that at that level, but we'll keep him away from our children. Thank you. If the document, the Kids Are Us policy, could be brought up, And uh, the policy, for, for taken to page 31 of that, which is ringtail 0694, heading B3.5. Now, the policy sets out in some detail, doesn't it, for the benefit of persons wanting guidance how to notify child protection services. Correct? It certainly does. And if we scroll down the page there is guidance as to what information should be given to child protection services when making the notification. Correct? It's true. Thank you. And I think there's also a form within the policy that they can fill out as well. I was going to take you to that. Uh, Thank you. Perhaps if we go to uh, Ringtail 0707. Is this the form you're referring to, Appendix B, C, Child Abuse Report? That's the form. Thank you. And one of the first things on the form is, has CPS been notified? Okay. Now, just different state governments have different names for departments. You referred to DHS before. Yep. Do you know what that is, Department of...? Human Services. Thank you. If we go to uh, the next page, 0708... There's again a form that offers guidance to uh, persons, volunteers, whoever, yep. in the church as to what details they should provide to That's child right. protection services. Thank you. And if we go to the next page, 0709, <coughs> the policy document itself lists the numbers for child protection services. That's right. And includes both city areas divided into regions yep. and if we go to the next page 0710 uh, country areas yep. that's right thank you and if we could go back to ringtail 0697 there's a 
series of, well, if you go back to the previous page, 0696, and to the heading 7 Basic Safety Principles Q&A, yep. the policy goes uh, in some <laughs> detail about uh, what children should be taught about their interaction with adults, correct? That's right. And if we go over to the next page, 0697, the policy goes into some detail in answering what could be termed you know, frequently asked questions. That's right. That's right. And so, as Pastor Spinella said, most of us, when we induct our children's workers, we'll get uh, the children's workers <laughs> process, and then they've got a, a perspective as to what may come their way, and it, it just it's helpful to them. So. How readily available is this policy document to uh, local churches in Victoria? Uh, it is there for anybody and everybody. If you go to our website, we can we can go through the website and we can gain access to this. <laughs> and if a pastor wanted a copy of this, a hard copy, yep. could they contact your office and say, could I please have a hard copy? Of Absolutely. Yeah. And you've already indicated that there were training days specifically on this policy? Uh, initially, yeah. And so they continue. Uh, there's a Kids Are Us national body. Uh, the Kids <laughs> national body have a conference in Victoria every year. Uh, this year we had 550 workers out to that conference. Um, and it is an ongoing journey with this policy and the teaching of our workers as to how to work with um, children. And so it is just ongoing. Yeah. Thank you. Just pardon me for my go. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chowdhury. Yes, nothing to ask. All right. Um, thank you, Pastor Baxter. Thank you for your attendance and you're otherwise excused. Thank you. Your Honour, we're ready to commence the, um, the Sunshine Coast Church part of the case study tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning at, at um, 10. Your uh, Honour, I seek leave to be excused. So you're excused, uh, Mr Thank Pratt. And, and uh, Mr Bird and I as well, Your Honour, if that pleases you. You too, um, Mr Woods and Mr Bird are both excused from further attendance. Uh, otherwise, 10 tomorrow. Thank you. All stand.